So I guess in order of effectiveness to scare people, minimal. Mm. And then the classic stay. Yep, everyone just left. I heard it again. Big Tech's ordinance has everything from complete firearms to OEM and aftermarket parts. If you're looking to put together your first AR-15, they have everything from those parts that you need to the tools that are going to be essential. If you're looking for suppressors, night vision, handheld lights, weapon lights, sights or optics, you name it, Big Tech's has it all. Not only that, they're offering all those brands that we like. Go visit them at BigTechsOrdinance.com. Filster makes awesome holsters, but not only that, they also happen to be one of those companies that are trendsetters. A lot of their designs are emulated by other companies. Not only does Filster make those holsters, but they also provide concealment systems like the Enigma, the Flex. They also have a lot of solutions when it comes to concealment solutions for medical. If you need to have a concealment first aid kit, they happen to sell them. Check them out at filsterholster.com. Primary Arms Government now offers the comprehensive agency trade-in program, so professional teams can get the most from their used or obsolete equipment. Working with GTI's asset training program, Primary Arms Government can offer you top dollar on any agency asset. From service weapons to uniforms, tools, and vehicles, their agency program is the best way to grow your agency's budget and upgrade with America's leading tactical brands. For more information, please visit www.primaryarms.com government. Walther is the performance leader in the firearms industry, renowned throughout the world for its innovation since Carl Walther and his son Fritz created the first blowback semi-automatic pistol in 1908. Today, the innovative spirit builds off the invention of the concealed carry gun with the PPK series by creating the PPQ, PPS, and the Q5 match steel frame series. Military, police, and other government security groups in every country of the world have relied on the high-quality craftsmanship and rugged durability of Walther products. Walther continues its long tradition of technical expertise and innovation in the design and production of firearms. For more information, visit WalterArms.com. So as the dude behind Eridus, my real question is, when are you finally going to do stuff for something like this? Listen, it's top secret, okay? I can't be I can't be broadcasting that to the world right okay, cause, now. Okay, because a Magpul stock. <laughs> you know, I, I should I should like I should write a little book on just all the absurd requests that I've gotten. That would be awesome. Because I've probably gotten requests for something like that. And most of those just like make it into the trash bin of my emails. So you know, you could probably just do a weekly post and people just love it. Cause I'm really, I'm really though waiting for the crumb for this, you know? Uh, so a couple of weeks ago I had Randy Lee of apex come to the shop and he, we did like armor classes here. And, uh, the, the one guy who helped Ashton out, you know, Ashton was supposed to host and he ended up getting sick. This guy brought like some super old school, little double barrel Derringer looking thing from who knows when. And so we're all like, oh my God, we need to collaborate on this for like the, ne the next April Fool's thing. Because yes, throwing a crom on there, throwing some like custom pistol grips on there. Yes. Vertical oh. grip. Yeah. <laughs> I think you're onto something. That, that's illegal. That's right. Oh, everything's illegal. It really is. Thought police. So at least you're here. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of glad. I was like, I better make sure that like all this stuff works. I've never used this setup before. So, oh. you know, we'll, we'll, we'll see how it goes. Hopefully. <laughs> I was like, boy, maybe it'll sound better than previous times. Now it's like, well, maybe in like a big empty echoey shop, which incidentally is only marginally better than like the office next to my four-year-old's bedroom. So mm -hmm. it's like, ah, I'll just do it from the shop. Yeah. <laughs> so how many 1301s do you own? 
I only have three. It's a oh. real problem. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm trying to source two more. Well, so interestingly enough, uh, so my landlord, who's you know my landlord of the shop, he just picked up a, a newest generation of the 1301, the one with a full length mag tube and everything. I hadn't and even heard of that. Yeah, yeah. That's not so, fair. So full capacity without needing an extension. Um, so he, he picked that up and I've been test fitting parts on his and I was like, Oh, Ooh. this is a little bit different. Just very, really? very, very slight differences for certain, at least so it seems anyways. Yeah. Um, so it's like, Oh man, I, I better pick up a couple of those, you know, especially in terms of yeah. you know, developing things, you know, parts that fit fine on the guns that I've got or, you know, a little bit tighter and, and good to know a little, a little more snug on his very good to know. I was like, well, Oh my gosh, thank goodness. I checked that. <laughs> yeah. So when I first got, when I got my first 1301, I now what's the, what would be the term? Eridist it out. Yeah, I did sure. everything. I, I'm a verb. I'm a verb. Yes, you are. <laughs> but to me, it, okay. I'm one of those people that I don't want to use or carry or even consider something until it's complete. Yeah. So going all Eridus on everything because it's functional. I like it. It works. So I got that, got it running. Awesome shotgun. Took it through Rob Hot's class. Wonderful time. And then I heard that Langdon was doing a 1301. Oh, that is awesome. And then I look at, I look it up and they're like, wait a minute, I have that. That's exactly what I have. I need to yeah. get one. Yeah. For, yeah well, we're right. I mean, that's the logical solution. Yeah. I mean, you know, four is one, Matt, come on. <laughs> <laughs> that's what the Navy SEALs say, right? I don't know. Okay, so Adam, did you get that 1301 issue ever resolved that was posted the other day? The one I said, and this is from Matt Dropko. Uh, the one I said I was going to tag you on Instagram. I didn't keep following the op to see if it was resolved. I guess I should check Instagram, huh? <laughs> that's, that's kind uh, of my the response what? to that one. Who the right, what? Right, right. What's up, guys? Hello. So, Rhett, you're not on tomorrow's episode two, are you? Uh, which one is that? Okay, that's a no. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> no, but I did message you about to see if you wanted to, if you were free to do a, an additional, um, what the hell is it called? Instructor cheat codes. Yes. That one. And so, yeah, my schedule's wide open for that. Uh, okay. And then also, oh, there's Steve. And also, the uh, I got you in the defensive weapons one, right? Yeah. The, okay. I mean, that's next week. Guns. Yep. 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 Good. <sighs> We're rolling in like seven minutes or are we going now? Uh, probably. I, I want to give the panel uh, enough time to actually get here. Cause if you say something, they all go, that's amazing. Or you say something, they say, that's the stupidest thing ever. I want it recorded. Cool. And I want to see you do videos with something like this. Uh, that's not going to happen. It, uh, sorry. I haven't even shot this yet. I have like three of these. I was going to do a project and. Uh, well, okay. So, so I'll, I'll never say never, but, um, my, one of my first shooting experiences was with a side-by-side -side and it was, it was one of those brutal things that like, you know, I was set up to fail and like deliberately scarred. And so oh. I'll do, I'll do shotguns, but I, um, yeah, like I felt like that probably, I don't know what they put in there. Yeah. Um, too dumb to ask, but I, I'm pretty sure that like that fractured my collarbone. Um, that explains why you walk funny. I mean, I don't know if that explains how I walk. <laughs> I don't think I've ever walk? seen you walk. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know though. Cheeking this with hammers. That just seems like that could hurt. Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's a lot going on there with the, and the, I mean the, the recoil from those, I, I don't know why, but I feel like pump guns for some reason are still softer than, you know, break action. Yeah. Um, there's no reason that that should be. And 1301s are softer still. Yeah, 1301s are pretty soft. Um, and Turkish garbage guns are even softer than that. But do they break just before you reload it? 
I, I have, I've only broken two. Out of but, one. I, sorry, I've, I've broken one and I've gotten one that was broken out of seven. Okay. So, now when you say the garbage guns, are you talking about the, the cheapo semi-autos? Yeah. Yeah. I, I think everyone refers to them as that. I think that their quality control is now at a level where it's kind of un, untenable. Um, but I had a long streak where those things just ran. Oh, that's cool. Like, uh, I, I mean, I was using them as like the, my fleet gun in classes and, and letting people beat on them. I was, I mean, I put, uh, I put close to 2000 shells through one. That's a long life for a shotgun. I think, um, I don't know. Um, based off our conversation from last week, I heard a vicious rumor that Remington might be producing those little tiny semi again. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. They, they, are. they heard us talking about it. That's, that's the only reason they did it. I think that they understand that gun probably costs them about the same to make as the, as the 870 does, but they can sell it for a grand. Why not? Oh yeah. I, I also heard that they are, um, they are listed like dealer pricing puts them back at the grand and not mm. the 1.5 or two that was out there. Yeah. 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 When I looked at gun broker, I was thinking, I really want one, but do I want it that much? Yeah. Right. I, uh, I won't, I won't say this on the, on the live part. Am I going to say this? Well, well, there are people watching, but you can't. Well, uh, okay. I won't, but I won't say it to everyone, but like, uh, they, uh, well, I, I had one and, um, I, and I actually ended up paying that, that full price tag for it. Yeah. And I think it was worth it. Um, okay. Yeah. What's wrong with saying that? Well, that's, I think that's awesome news. I'm a cheap That's encouraging. Guy. So like, Oh, so am I on a, on a gun was like, ah, for me. Uh, oh no, that's, that's definitely painful and it better be worth it. Um, I have a buddy who has his eye on a, either the century or the PTR MP5 clones. And I have a PTR and I said, dude, before you spend any money, take mine, take it for a few days, just make sure this is something that you actually want because it sucks after you spend that 15, $2,000 and then go, oh, it's a paperweight now. Yeah. Yeah. They're fun. Yeah. That's a great Absolutely. little like, weird cheap thing too. Can get well, and I blame Steve Fisher. Cause I saw him posting about all his and also uh, that's, that's, I have that effect. yes, you do. And same with Scallywag. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Oh, and shotgun gosh. stuff. Shotgun stuff. I'm, a matter of fact, speaking of shotguns, I have a new shotgun on the way that Mossberg is sending me. Nice. So like your own personalized model. No, the, no, the let's Steve, not get too carried. Let's Steve not get Yeti too carried away Fisher with that. It'd be boring. Signature. It'd be a boring gun. Hey, hey, if it works, it'd be a boring gun. No, they are they are sending me one of the new 940 semi-autos out. Oh, cool. To be done for quite a while, and that, that'll get put in the uh, the class rotation list for a bit. And I'm going to rip it apart, and I'm going to see if if it stays viable, which I think it will, because the price point on that gun is really good for a for the features it has, right? Like yeah. I've played with a couple at the local shop recently, um, but for the features that it does have, I want to see if it's viable enough for Adam to make a mount for it for the Magpul stocks. Yeah. Hey, so uh, those are in the wild now. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. They're just, they're starting to trickle out. Yeah. Yeah. I've, uh, it's on my plan to pick up a couple. So, you know, yeah. maybe this week we'll see how it goes. There you go. You know, I'm, I'm kind of excited for it. So the, the, the market is due for another quality semi-auto gun that will fit a roll that's $840. You know, that, that's what I saw it for street price at the local fun shop. And I was like, for that price, yeah, definitely. So what's different about that than the existing semi-autos from uh, oh. Mossberg? 
uh, for everything that I've been told, updated the operating systems on it, made it more reliable. They've added the um, plate system for Red Dot built right into the receiver. Oh, already comes complete with a factory mag tube extension on it. Blah, 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 blah. But the only thing you had to do is add a side saddle to it and go. Cool. And I, also with the, uh, with the siding system, I understand it uses the MOS system. So that's awesome. That was a joke. Yeah, that wasn't real. Of it. I know. I know. It's a variation there. I've got, yeah, no, uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Cause I'm going to send another gun out to get cut. Yeah. The receiver cut from Andrew and those guys, uh, just because I'm playing with another idea on one for a cut, um, to basically sink like a little 507 K site into it. Yeah. Because why not? So I'm just uh, playing with stuff. Cody snuck in. I didn't even see him come in. That's Cody. He does that a lot. Are you in motion right now? Or are you parked? Uh, yeah, currently doing currently doing about 78 miles. Because you sound here. really good. I know, right? It's crazy. Well, look at Cody. It might that be picture. the Wi-Fi booster in the truck. <laughs> uh, look at that picture of Cody with that nice jacket. That nice Adam Arcteryx jacket. Okay. Hey, thank so, you. Ian, that is what the is it, exact question. What is it, in Vegas? Yeah, he's freezing exactly. or what? <laughs> um, Ian has a wonderful question that I also am interested in hearing about. Mm -hmm. Adam, when did that Gen 3 come out? Or actually anyone that knows the Gen oh, 3 I, 1301. I, I don't know exactly. Uh, what good are you? None. <laughs> At least you're honest. Well, I thought it was about a year, year and a half ago. Was it about a year ago? Really? I thought, was it about a year ago with the updates? So is the Langdon a Gen 2 or Gen 3? No, it has to be a Gen 2. Yeah, they've been using Gen 2s um, simply yeah. just because they've been using the Nordic tube yeah. extensions, yeah. whereas the I guess, I guess everyone's referring to it as Gen 3 is what is coming um, you know, with that one-piece mag yeah. tube. So with the Gen 3 also, they, they still do have the finger grooves? So oh. More Glock <laughs> references, yeah. Oh. Good night, everybody. Yes. The best thing this industry can do with shotguns is get rid of pistol grip stocks. Yeah. It's the yes. best thing they could ever do. Yes. They should as, get rid of every pistol grip stock known to mankind. They're garbage. As someone who didn't know any better, I thought they were the coolest thing, but yeah. then tried to do stuff with it. No. Dude, Except horrible. if it's a breaching shotgun. That's different. A little different animal, but yeah, it's, yeah. it's, a, it's a horrible stock for anything else. It's terrible. So I think we have the main guts of the panel. Oh man, this is going to be a well-rounded out discussion. Now I know, and we haven't officially started, though this will probably still make something. Uh, Rhett does have limited time. So I think he wants to say some things that are very offensive to everyone right off the bat. So before we do that, let's Excellent. do some intros. Uh, so this is episode 295. We're going to be talking about defensive shotguns. We're going to be talking about uh, barrel lengths, calibers, actions, accessories, you know, like lights and Eridus stuff, because you can't say shotgun. You can't even think shotgun without thinking Eridus. This episode is brought to you by Eridus. Um, not, no, not really. I'm just a fan. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, my, my background's in law enforcement. Uh, been a fan of shooting forever. I never really was that big of a fan of shotguns up until I, I had a realization this was probably the weak that shotgun skills were the weak link in my whole skill set. So I thought I better take a class. So I took a class with Rob Hot, and my view of shotguns has changed so drastically. Huge fan of them now. Uh, absolutely love breaking them out when I can. I'm in the process of seeing if I can change my department policy to allow for having them as a deadly force option versus just being a sock or a, a non-deadly uh, option. But it's exciting to, to see the development. It's exciting to see where we've been and where we're going. And also the options that we have right now, because right now there are some such cool options and to hear some, some of the developments and also some of the products that we've been waiting for that already were out, they're getting re-released. So that's good. Um, so yeah, background law enforcement, been doing that since last century. I've uh, been doing the primary and secondary thing for a couple of years now and podcasts in 16. It's just, it's a blast to bring people like this of this caliber uh, together of this gauge together uh, to have. Thanks, Eric. 
um, just for these seriously awesome focused discussions. And we can really talk about some stuff that, uh, well, it's, it's not that common to hear people talk at, talk about at this level. So with that, let's, let's hear from that Adam person since he has red hair. <laughs> is, is that the uh, criteria for going first, I guess? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I'm Adam Roth. I have Eridus Industries. Um, so, I mean, for about eight years now, I've been working on and making shotgun accessories. And through that, um, I mean, that's, that's more or less where my credentials end. Um, you know, I, I've trained with a whole bunch of different, you know, instructors. Um, you know, so, I mean, I've gotten to see a pretty good sample size of what is taught. And, uh, you know, so, I mean, you know, that's, that's kind of where I'm at with it, you know, basically just taking parts to classes, making sure everything works the way it's supposed to make sure that nothing gets bit by the good idea fairy that thinks that something is good and, you know, don't actually use it. So, um, yeah, yeah, that's about it. Make shotgun stuff. So what was the first thing you made that basically established Eridus? Was it the uh, shotgun caddy? Yeah, the yeah. The, caddy? Yeah, the flagship product was the quick detach carrier or QDC, which is a, a rigid mounted uh, detachable shell carrier system. So you can you know, easily carry more ammunition. You know, ammo carriage is a little bit of a, a task with shotguns. And so it was really just kind of trying to find a good solution for that problem. I remember writing a short blurb for Recoil Magazine when we met up at shop about that. Yes, but and back still, in the early days. Yes, yeah, before still, times. Uh, that's right. <laughs> still such an awesome product. Oh, thank you. Awesome. Yeah, great stuff. And then we have Rhett. Yo. Uh, yeah, I'm Rhett Newmare. Uh, I own Demonstrated Concepts. It's, uh, I, I do firearms training, pistol, rifle, shotgun stuff. I do a lot of uh, weird form factor gun stuff i'm kind of uh i'm kind of obsessed with the smaller or the smallest guns so i carry a micro um my my home defense shotgun is a one of the 12 gauge firearms um the ars that i use are are super tiny so uh, uh yeah that's my thing i um, been doing training for a uh, decade and shooting competitively that whole time. And then alongside that, I've been doing like, uh, I guess that the, the training resume would be um, doing like industrial medical device, taking people apart, training people how to do that for also for a decade. So uh, not really in the gun world, but it sure helps to know how people work and how people come apart. Yes. Yes. So of uh, basically the three categories, we have pistols, we have shotguns, we have rifles, which of those do you spend more time using and which do you enjoy more? I enjoy shooting uh, shotgun stuff a lot. Um, I do, uh, I do a decent amount of like, I'll say that, that the AR stuff is probably the, the one that is the least time spent on there. Um, because they're easy. They are absolutely. Boring. Yeah. Uh, like even when you do weird stuff with them, they're boringly easy to shoot. So, uh, and then, you know, so I, you know, a lot of pistol and then pleasure side is a lot of shotgun. Yeah. Cool. Eric. Oh, hold on. Yep. Got a drink. Jesus. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Steve. <laughs> Uh, Eric Gellhouse, uh, retired cop, been teaching a gun site for about 20 years. When it comes to the shotgun, I was fortunate enough to come up under Bill Jeans and Louis Auerbach, Scotty Reitz, uh, being a student of theirs. Got to teach with Randy Kane for a couple couple times when he was still on staff at gun site. Um, that's, that's kind of my background with it, aside from the law enforcement side, which we talked about in the last episode. As a firearms instructor in law enforcement, were you also a shotgun armor? Yeah, so 870 armor, because um, that was that was what we had in the organization. Yeah, 300 plus 300 ish Remington uh, 870s of various flavors over the time. Yeah, cool. Cody, 
Hey guys, I'm Cody. Thanks for having me on here. Um, Vencomp Systems. Look at all you guys. I know all you guys. Rhett, we haven't met in person. Matt, neither in person. Not yet. So nice to meet you guys. Uh, yeah, Vencomp Systems. We've been building fighting shotguns for 32 years. I've been here for 17 years officially on the payroll. Oh, wow. And <laughs> yeah, so uh, we moved the company. Um, Hans Vang retired in 2019, uh, sold the company to our best dealer up in Las Vegas. Uh, Mike Jones at Freedom Firearms. So we moved the company up here in March of 21. And here we are keeping doing the damn thing. Kind of like Adam. I mean, uh, go make stuff, go see if it shakes off in classes and then come back to the drawing board and play around. So just been kind of evolving that forever. Um, my title, I'm officially the president of the company, but that just means that I'm the janitor also and uh, yeah. you know, keeping things running. So yeah, that's, that's it. I mean, I sat through, you know, saw Louis stuff back in the day. I grew up at a gun site. So uh, Louis and Bill Jean. So those are, those are uncles to me. Same with uncle Pat coming up here, May the 4th, rest in peace. Um, so those are all kind of mentors to me, uh, brought me into the shooting area. Cause my dad was a uh, uh, facilities maintenance guy out at gun site, a designated bad guy and a barn rat, you know, resetting the targets and making sure all the steel runs. So um, my summers were kind of pulling weeds for the Coopers, um, you know, getting lemonade and brownies and, uh, just kind of grew up in this, this realm. So I'm honored to be here and to continue the fighting shotgun, you know, sort of bring it on into the new age, putting electronics on them now, you know, people are rolling over in their graves, but we're doing what we can. That's awesome. So what, what's the extent of all the services Van Comp does? <laughs> well, Every, pretty much everything. <laughs> We can. Yeah. Yeah. So we have a full service gun smithy, so we can, um, you know, machining and, and making stuff custom. We can do all that, but also essentially it's turning bird guns into fighting guns. So, Oh, cool. Yeah. Like kind of, Hey, there you are. Yeah. So, uh, on that thing, we could lengthen the force and cone and back forward a little bit to reduce the recoil, tighten the shot pattern, reduce the muzzle rise. That's the van comp system. That was the technology. I don't know if we want to get into that now or. Oh, oh we but, will. Uh, we will. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Copy. So yeah, that thing, length and force and cone back for no problem. Um, cut it down, put a sight on it, do whatever you like. Uh, silver solder is one of our, the things that we do kind of a lost art um, as far as putting sights and bases onto, you know, com putting dissimilar metal together. Silver solder is one of the best ways to do that without messing with heat temper. So cool. um, yeah, silver soldered sights, making sure stuff stays put, especially on these violent little 12 gauges. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Steve. Thank you. Ooh, Steve Fisher, uh, industry guy, trainer, consultant, product developer. Um, I was one of the original people that Beretta brought in to test the 1301 pre-release. During more and training Thanks, a lot Steve. of their engineering. Just saying, buddy. And training up some of their engineers and salespeople and staff on that gun. Uh, been a lifelong Vang Comp user since I was old enough to know what a fighting shotgun was. And that started out with a Smith & Wesson 3000 gun sight model from about 1989 era. Still have that gun today, still runs like a champ. And yeah, I've done a few projects with Robar over the years on some shotguns and with Vang Comp on cool. some sighting systems as well. So right now, if there was one shotgun that you had, if there was one for you to grab right now, what would it be for defensive purposes? That's a good call. Uh, it would most likely be an 870 or a 590 that have both been modified by Vang and Eridus because they're both in the back of the truck right now after I just got done teaching shotgun for a couple of days. Um, while I love a lot of my other guns and a lot of my fun guns from 1100s, 1187s, Benelli's, Berettas, and I love them all, give me an 870 or a Mossberg 590 any day of the week. Cool. Good stuff. So since Rhett is short on time, you, Rhett, why don't you take it away and, and offend everyone? Okay. So I, actually, I don't know what you're going to say. So, yeah, I don't know. I don't know how offensive I'll be. I, um, be. I, I think for, <clears throat> so the topic is, is uh, shotguns for the normal guy. Yeah. Right? Um, I think shotguns are an awesome tool for defense. Uh, I just think that, we haven't quite built them the right way for defense yet, or, or I should say we haven't started offering many options out of the box that are optimized for something like home defense for the majority of people. Talking about the majority of people who are living in tiny cramped homes 
um, who uh, don't necessarily need to put a, a pellet of double lot buck, you know, 25 inches deep into something. Uh, so the few things, few things I'll go over that I think are, are um, awesome. Like all of the loads, even the reduced recoil, like sissy self-defense loads. We're talking about buckshot and, and we're talking about self-defense loads. I'm, I'm really, I'm talking about um, maybe number four buck, but generally number one buck, double lot buck, or in some weird cases, slugs. All of the offerings in that ammo are still ridiculously overkill out of a short barrel. Um, so like even flight controls, eight pellet, double lot buck, awesome stuff. Um, they they could make a pump gun only version of that, reduce the recoil even more on that, and you would still easily blow past the FBI minimum 18 or maximum 18 inches penetration on, on gel. Um, so I'm kind of excited to see more offerings, more, even more reduced recoil loads come, come out. Um, I also am, am weirdly excited for this, like the 590 um, S that, that just kind of recently came out, the one that takes the short shells. Oh, okay. Um, I hope that they, because we don't need all of the room, right? Because the short shells, uh, they could work. I, I hope that we get less recoil and I hope that we get more capacity out of tinier guns. Um, I'm saying a whole lot right now. I'm You're sorry. That I got a jam here in like, in like 10 minutes. Um, but, uh, yeah, so on the ammo side, right. I think we can shorten up the shells, get more capacity, make the guns run that stuff better, get less recoil on the gun side. Um, it's weird to me, that the double standard in the industry. So, uh, we have basically decided that uh, across like military law enforcement, all of the civilian trainers out there, we've decided that in the AR realm, having the M16 length gun, the A2 stock that is a 14 and a half inch length of pole, that is a 20 inch barrel, uh, we've decided that that is kind of ridiculous for any mission set because it went away for like all mission sets except for you know special purpose rifle stuff. And when we look at what what in the AR realm is appropriate for home defense or for pushing buildings and working in tight spaces like small rooms, tight corners and vehicles, uh, we see most people gravitating towards something like a 10.5 or an, uh, a 12.5 AR, somewhere in that length. Um, so the M16, I say this because the M16 OAL is 39 inches overall. The Mossberg 590, the seven shot, not the 20 inch barrel, the 18 inch barrel, that's 39 inches overall. Like, why are these guns so unnecessarily long, right? Uh, we don't need that. And then the other thing that I'll harp on um, that I think people are starting to come to terms with is the length of pull, the ridiculous long length of pull. Um, we have youth stocks being used comfortably by dudes that are your size and you are a giant, right? Uh, so if you scale that down to someone that is my size, right? The, I'm, I'm the absolute normal height, like the, the BDC, the leading reticles are based off of my height. Um, that's really, that's something like a 10 inch length of pole. And I don't see anyone going that short on the stocks there. Uh, I'm definitely going shorter than that, right? Like, a, you know, I'm, I'm fine with, no length of pull because just get rid that's of right. the stock. Really. That's right. Uh, but I, I understand that some people want, want to split the recoil between hands and shoulder. I think we need to shorten that up. Um, I would like to see more offerings where you could, you know, maybe start at 12 and a half inches and be able to go down just under, you know, right at nine inches, I think would be the, the, the minimum there for, for comfort for folks. Well, even the Magpul stocks have there are extensions for it. I don't think I've ever seen anyone use it though. Right. So yeah, the minimum. Okay. On that is Steve Fisher is the exception. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, that's that was kind of the the 
the fight I wanted to pick or or my complaint here for for a gun that is used exclusively for close quarters and is going to be pressed into these small spaces. I would really like to see them get smaller. I think the Mossberg Shockwave and all of those kind of guns get closer to it, but we're still not building those as well as we could. So um, if I had to nerd out, the, the way that I'm running those is like, I, I like my Shockwaves. Um, I like the semi-auto variants better, like that TAC-13 is yeah. awesome. Um, but the other thing, here's the other, the other AR comparison. We have learned that it is kind of more ergonomic, easier to shoot with an upright head position, not craned neck. And the way that we can do that most easily is by keeping the barrel somewhat lower on the jaw or, or towards the chest and getting an elevated optic on those guns. Um, it it kind of was necessary for the AR, right? But uh, I, I think that um, the elevated optic on guns, like short little guns, like the, the SBSs, um, can let you get even smaller, even shorter on that length of pull. And all of a sudden, like a, a nine inch or a 10 inch length of pull, when you have an elevated optic on something like a, an SBS 590, it feels like your AR that you're so used to um, but with kind of more of the ergonomics of the, the stock configuration, more traditional stock, not the pistol grip awfulness that, that yeah. don't hurt. Right. Um, so yeah, maybe, maybe that's my piece. Yeah. yeah I think uh, your observations with the ammo, that's a really cool concept because they're already making the, the short barrel for pistol duty ammo stuff. For shotguns, that just makes sense. My question on that would be whether, what's your definition of capacity? Is it overall pellets in the tube or is it serving sizes in the tube? Sure. I, I think, I think both, but I think eight pellets is going to be, I mean, we, we see that it's enough, right? I think that six pellets, a double lot buck is also going to be absolutely enough. And when I saw federal releasing that shorty shell, uh, the 175 length shell with six yeah. pellets, a double lot buck. I was like, well, you do something like a flight control or a canister, like where the whole shot column is inside of a cup and only breaks apart when it hits the target. Um, like the old school federal cheater slugs. Cut uh, yeah. 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 Stuff like that. Uh, that would be awesome. And then like overall capacity, um, you know, more is more, but, with the majority of people running like four shot hunting guns in defense encounters. And I still haven't found a defensive, uh, like a, a non-law enforcement or military defensive reload in a, in a shoot, I, you know, I, I don't think we need to make the mag tubes longer for defense. Uh, we can definitely that five shell, uh, you know, the, the way that the, um, the shockwave is set up right now, I think it's just long enough. Sure. I'm, I was just saying, you know, if you get eight mini shells in the same spot as five full length shells, you're going 63 projectiles down to like 48 projectiles, but you're serving, you're cutting it up into eight slices. So I like it. I also see a feature in that as well. Now we just need to convince, actually, I guess we're the people that should be making the decisions here. The <laughs> regulations of some of this stuff just needs to go away because it makes zero sense. Yeah. Eric, you, you look like you have something to say about that. Well, yeah, we could go shorter if we didn't have to deal with the ATF issues, right? And the state issues on overall length, barrel length. Um, we could probably, should probably clean up and go 16 inch barrel on all long guns. Unfortunately, I have the feeling that if we tried to open it up for that, what we would get is 18 inch barrel length on all the long guns or longer rather than shorter. Um. The, the shorter shells and the reduced capacity is interesting. Um, that's not something I'd kicked around as much because I'd seen a lot of, we well, seen some reliability problems with them and feeding with them. I'm more interested in what Rhett's been doing with going to the bird's head grips and some of kind of the alternative positions. It, it, and, and that's not the right word for it. I don't know what he's calling it, but the stuff that he's done along those lines is, in, is pretty interesting. Yeah, appreciate it. I, um, 
you know, ditching the stock, I think, I think all of you guys who, you know, everyone in here knows their way around a shotgun pretty well. Um, I know all of you guys could very easily go out and take full power double lot buck uh, and run a gun entirely without a stock because you guys know either push pull or just in some cases just grip pressure uh, because the way that uh, shotgun is the the recoil impulse is interesting to me that um, even on the really nice loads it's not at all a long shove and i think the reason why i like like people like semi-autos so much is because it dissipates a little bit of that initial shock impulse um, but like i've watched myself and others shoot on the super slow-mo camera and even dudes um, who are just beasts uh, you take that shot and it skips the grip on your hand almost a quarter inch, no matter how hard you're gripping it. Um, I think that's, you know, when you get people who aren't gripping the gun well, that's what scares everyone off. So if you can, you know, if we can game it out and, and uh, you know, lighten that recoil, that initial impulse a little bit, I think it's huge. And then, you know, on the same, same line, I'm talking about shortening shells and, and doing wider loads. It, that definitely does cut recoil. Yep. I've put, uh, I've put the federal shorty shells in new shooters hands um, with the shock wave with five minutes of, of instruction on it. And all of a sudden the, that, that little bit of reduction in recoil there is enough where I don't see it jumping out of people's hands, even without a stock. So if we get, if we get one more level of reduced recoil, stocks are really kind of superfluous for, for the precision that we need indoors for the precision that we would ever use as, as citizens, you know, defending ourselves within a residence, Steve. Yep. One of the issues he brings up uh, as far as stock movement, <clears throat> having done some testing with a couple of places in the recent year or two, it's because the stocks are too short. There's not enough tension being applied fore and aft of the gun. Because of the short stocks being cramped over the guns, I've taken a lot of shooters recently and some testing and added with the magpul spacers to find control levels with various loads of bucks, slug, accuracy stuff, the whole nature of the beast. Having a little bit more length. So we run ARs fully open, most of, most of us. We run the full length. Got it. There, there is a thing as fit. We understand that length of pull, finding a happy place. Um, with that, right, with that length of pull change, um, we're finding it creates a little bit more tension for the shooters and a little bit more overall control because now we're not cramped over this little stock that's sliding up and down in body positions because there's really not enough contact or enough tension between the two guns, between the two parts of the gun. Uh, while the mantra for years has been shorter butt stocks, and a lot of that mainly has been to either A, reach controls or prevent short stroking of a slide action or pump action, properly fitted, we haven't found that issue yet and gaining a little bit more control over the gun with a little bit longer length of pull. I'm not talking the 11 and a quarter inch length of pull with the mag pull or the 14 inch length of pull with the mag pull, but I'm talking the 13 inch 12 and three quarter spacing, depending a couple of things on body mechanics of the shooter and how they place the guns. <laughs> and while Rhett brings up some good points on stuff, pure ballistics formulas with certain ammo, we also understand that some of the federal law enforcement blue hauled XYZ slug penetrates less than the flight control buckshot and bare ballistic gelatin by about six to eight inches. But now we're back to a single aimed projectile, right? Versus a beehive of projectiles coming out of the gun. I think the problem you will find with that ballistically is that as you're applying, no matter what that velocity comes down to, to still make it effective to do said job, you know, either they're in short shells or reducing it even more down to say a thousand to eleven hundred feet per second. You're still going to see a lot of extreme penetration issues because of the type of projectiles you're using. You're not going to get rid of physics and science. It's just one of those pieces of the puzzle, unless you develop and go back to either softer lead or some type of other material that would allow greater expansion. 
right? It was this year, people tried to do a water pellet um, or with flats in them or uh, the buckshot that broke apart. We've seen all kinds of variables, segmented slugs, all these things. I don't know if there is one correct answer on that yet. I think technologically, the advances could happen. I think by that time, it'll be a too, little bit too late in the formulas to gain any traction. Or it'll be granted in a very limited, in a very limited niche group. I think a couple of things you said, um, I immediately started thinking about the, the typical end user and the importance, what you said about fitting the stock and fitting the gun to the, the shooter. Not enough people, I think, even consider that. Um, one of the things I was thinking about with when Rhett was talking was uh, when those shockwaves were first introduced, how, how they were, it was a laughing stock. It was a joke. And then people started saying, oh, wait a minute, this, we could, we could do this. And to get, a, get over that, that's that, that stigma. Uh, it's, it's cool how it's, it's starting to spread, but yeah, there's that lowest common denominator user that we need to uh, somehow educate. That's where these, that's where these discussions come in, but yeah. Uh, additionally with what Steve was saying also with physics. Yeah. We are looking at pistol like performance where you're poking holes and depending on the projectile, it might be a lot of holes, but you're, we're, we're not seeing anything beyond that. At least nothing measurable. And as, as someone who takes apart bodies. So I, I'll, yeah. I'll say on, on that with, with some of the, some of the buckshot, um, when, when you have stuff that is still hitting in a column and, uh, and you have stuff that it, when it impacts in a column, you get shot dispersion. So like flight control inside of 10 yards is basically a slug, yeah. right? But you hit yeah, them with that it. slug, the, the first row in, of the, or the first column of shot uh, is impacted by the second column of shot while being compressed by the tissue. And That's you get cool. this expansion, um, this cone. That makes sense. Very rapid expansion inside of wounding uh, or inside the wound cavity. And that, I think, I think there you actually do see sympathetic wounding leading to stretch tearing because, because but, of things. But, but only, only the flesh that's in direct contact with the projectiles. Correct. But that's, right. but that's yeah. still awesome. That is an awesome right. well, concept. We're not talking about like the, the make-believe magical yeah. inside of gel. And we're yeah. talking about a little extra tear for your that's buck cool. in the first couple inches of wounding. Yeah. Um, and, and that's, uh, uh, when, so, so Steve was saying that about the, about the physics there, I think on the, on the physics side, the velocity of those projectiles, the weight of double lot buck and the velocity, if you go down to something ridiculous, like low, low, like 1100 feet per second. Um, well, we're talking about a 40 grain projectile moving roughly at 1000 or 1100 feet per second. And, uh, through heavy clothing and gel, when I do the test on 22 long rifle, which is a 40 grain projectile moving at a thousand feet per second, I'm seeing like right at 16 inches of penetration. Um, like it kind of on a 16 inch block after denim, occasionally one of those will just poop out the end of the block and you find it on the table a foot away. Um, so I, you know, I think that's kind of that, that sweet spot where we're still making all of these loads at 1300 FPS. And also uh, maybe we're not loading the right powder. I, I'm doing myself a disservice here because I'm going to, I'm going to give away my, my favorite ammo here and it's going to sell out everywhere. Um, but the difference between Fiocchi loads and like federal loads of the same velocity is kind of amazing. Um, the way that they, I don't know how they're doing it, but on a chronograph, they, they chrono the same, but that initial impulse that is so violent on all of the other loadings is like soft. It's like a, a more gradual curve on the acceleration. I just don't, I don't feel, you know, I can shoot a 1300 foot, uh, foot per second slug in the Fiocchi and then I shoot the federal blue shell, the LE shell. They're going exactly the same speed on my gun. One beats me up a hell of a lot more than the other. So yeah, there's Fiocchi magic and the, there's the, we can do it's, this physics thing. 
is it the Fiocchi three quarter ounce versus the ounce to ounce and a quarter federal? No, no, because you get even more ridiculously low recoil when you go to the three right. quarter. That, that, Those that's, ones, a, that's a very popular three gun slug. We used yeah. to shoot them in matches all the time, and it's a screamer. Yeah, those three gun slugs, they they the recoil impulse on those out of a pump gun is less than birdshot out of a semi-auto. Yeah. Uh, guys, I'm sorry, I have to jam. I'm sorry I can't stay for this whole one. I'm really interested to, yeah. to work in on it. Well, thanks for joining us so far, though. This has been this has been great. You'll just have to listen and take notes and yell at me later. Right. Right. But awesome. Thanks for having me, Matt. And, and uh, thank you guys. You guys have a good night. Thanks. We'll see you. So I have a short list of a couple things I thought would be nice to discuss. In your guys' opinion, in seeing various testings and all that good stuff, say we're just talking, well, what would you say would be the most common other than clearly birdshot as a defective or as a defensive or defective shell, double lot, eight pellet, optimally. If you're really lucky, you have number one from federal flight control, which I have a couple sleeves of. My clients are a little different because they have the barrel system, you know, the barrel magic. So, so they don't, they don't really need have the, to. Yeah. Depending so what, what groups you're going for. So if you have a van comp system on your shotgun and you're using federal flight control, you mm -hmm. create a singularity. <laughs> so there's there's a little bit of debate about that just because some folks will pattern their guns with flight control and then they send it to us and then they pattern it again. Some people, not everybody, get even bigger patterns. So mm -hmm. it really depends. And since the barrels are all the same, essentially, uh, this is where we find out that each shotgun is a unique and beautiful snowflake. That's right. So like everybody here, they're not in their heads, right? It's a, it's, you got to pattern your shotgun with your ammo yeah. because every, every gun's going to do something a little different with every load. We've had, we've had customers, big dollar customers, pallets of ammo. They'll say, Hey, do a bunch of barrels and shoot this ammo through it. And then send me the six inch gun. I want the gun to shoot six inches at 25 yards. So being close to gun site, we've done that for a few different clients. And, um, every barrel is exactly the same. We machine in the same exact way based on the, you know, the exit, uh, diameter, uh, aperture. And it's some of them like them better. I mean, Steve has seen it. He talked to me about some 20 inch guns that are 20 inch guns. are throwing some weird patterns and harmonics of different barrel hangers and locations. There's, there's not exactly a code to crack there because once you think you've got it, it's something else makes more sense. And, it's really, yeah, uh, all shotguns are different, but, um, yeah, when our clients are asking for like a four or five inch pattern inside the house, we generally just tell them number one buck, um, seems to be the best way to, to attempt to get that. So then, there, oh, go ahead. No, go ahead, Matt. No, no, I'm, I'm going to go somewhere else. So please. The, 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 the variable in shot shells, right. Is, is one thing, uh, we, we've recently seen, you know, maybe some QC issues out of some very popular loads. Um, as well as the way the ammo is stored, which has changed patterns. Uh, we have seen ammo that has been left racked in cruiser guns in patrol cars. That vibration has shifted shot columns and buffering causing patterns in flight control even. Yeah. We have seen shot shells that have been stored in glove box and vehicles and dealing with a heat ratio problem. We've seen all these variables in testing. And it's not just, you know, here's this shell, this is the greatest shell in the world. I have shot this year alone close to 3,000 rounds of buckshot this year already. Because I don't shoot birdshot. I shoot buck and slug for about the past two years now. That's that's all I've switched to 100%. Um, and look. Yep, Steve Fisher Internet. At least it's a good picture. He's frozen. His situation. Oh, he's back. Yeah. There he is. You, you, were, you were gone for a little bit. You were frozen. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Um, so, so there's a lot of things based on, you know, ammo storage, the way it's kept in cruiser guns, the way it's kept in house guns, vibrations. There is a million and five things. I saw this last year in California with some guys from LAPD's firearms unit. They had their flight control loads that had either been stuffed in guns or in the cars, and they were blowing patterns at 10 yards. And it looked like Winchester, green-hauled military oh, ammo, like legitimately. It was horrible. 
That's you might as well have just shot it into a crowd and hoped for the best. And discussing that with those guys was the same thing. Vibration with the guns being set in cruisers with ammo in the mag tubes under constant vibration, constant load. There is so many things that go into this. Um, having shot some shotguns on high, high speed cameras for slow motion footage. Yeah. We've seen harmonic issues in barrel whip. Um, th- there's a lot of weirdness, thin walled barrels versus thicker walled barrels, you know, early 1970s, 80s, 870s versus late 80s, 90s, 870s. It's all over the map. You still have to test your gun and your ammo. The problem is guys only shoot one round of that preferred buckshot at, at each yardage out of a box. Yep. When I can fire a box of buckshot at the same distance and come up with four different patterns out of the five rounds fired. Yeah, it, it, it's, a, it's a very real beast. It's funny the way you just described that. And I immediately thought of discussions from 20 years ago talking about like sniper rifle stuff. Yeah. Yes. But we're talking about shotguns. Yes. <laughs> we were just doing some testing in Utah with Silencer Co. And we were on the high speed cameras and we did a lot of measuring sound at different barrel lengths with different um, suppressor baffle stacks and different ammunition. And that's uh, a phrase we came up with, like during the third string of testing, we shot over 500 rounds of flight control that day. It was, it was a lot of testing. Um, and yeah, it was, we said we dabbled in the illogical because uh, <laughs> you see it on high speed and you're just like, that doesn't really make any sense. Hmm. Uh, the thing that comes to mind was just the, there was a cool video I'm going to put out later. Not, I don't know. I got to edit that high speed video, but uh, parts of being a small business owner, right, Adam? That's right. <laughs> Everyone else here too. Um, but there's some cool video of, of watching the, the gas come out of the ports. And when it hits the different baffles in the suppressor, you can actually watch it push the gas out and then it, it sucks the gas in and then blows it back out and breathes as it fills each baffle. Oh, that's it's, cool. It is pretty cool. So I've, I've got that. I'll, I'll edit that out. But just like Fisher was saying, you can see it in high speed, watch the whip, watch the harmonics. And none of that stuff you can really calculate for. And I don't think any of the manufacturers that are doing it have calculated you know, what exactly is going on in there. We just know that cylinder bore, cylinder bore, you know, improved cylinders. So if you want to be a little bit tighter and modified and all the fun stuff, I don't know. It's, it is interesting to, to us, Vancom systems, seeing the, the barrels through the years. And you can see Fisher will tell you too, some of those older shotguns, they're just, they're sniper rifles. And, you know, the wall thickness, it doesn't really make sense. Uh, the wall thickness is really thin at the end and, you, should, you would think the pressure spike would still be going when you cut them back to 18, 14, 12 inches. And uh, you just, you don't, it doesn't add up. I don't know. But then you got an off the shelf Mossberg, you know, 20 inch in a, in a shotgun class. The guy's first time he's ever taken it out of the box and he's shooting six inch patterns at 25 yards. And you're like, what the heck, man? So for you guys, in your opinion, what would be the shortest that you would go for a shotgun for defensive purposes? <laughs> For the barrel. This is for everybody, right? Yeah. Like didn't I've got have to deal with SBS again. I'd still go to, I'd go to 14, right? That, that's on a pump gun. Now we start talking the 1301s, which everybody loves. Yep. Gas we, systems. We and, and, yeah. yeah. Steve also 14. No, I'm going to go 18. Oh, okay. I'm going 18 for a couple of variables, but yeah, I would stay doing an 18 inch gun. I have an SBS. That's a 16 gun. I have a short barrel, 870, 14 factory gun. I have a couple other short barrel Benelli's in the system and <laughs> some other weird guns. Nice. Um, I'm, I'm living the dream at 18, 18, five. Cody. Um, probably an 18, just cause I'm most comfortable with it. And with tubular magazines, you know, you're right there with the capacity equals barrel length. And once you go longer, true. Um, true. so I'm excited mm-hmm. about the, the short shell stuff in the future too. So we'll see that, but I did some suppressor testing and, uh, after taking that Clint Smith, the Thunder Ranch class, he came out here to Vegas and he was talking about not wanting to touch off a defensive load of buckshot inside the house. Uh, because of, you know, rattling your molars loose or something like that. It's like, you don't want to touch up a shot and be bleeding from your eardrums. Uh, so we did some testing on it actually to see what's a safe, you know, shot inside of a house. And with a 12 inch shotgun and a eight inch salvo, you're going to get 147 decibels of flight control inside the house. And I think that'd be pretty sweet. 
So when I'm king, I think I'm going to give everybody a 12 inch gun with an eight inch salvo on a, on a pump gun of your choice. I'm for that. <laughs> Adam, how about you? What, what's, what would be your optimal barrel length? I mean, I'm, I guess I'm mostly stuck at 18 since I don't have an SBS. Um, you know, that being said, God, I hate to like just talk about 1301s all the time because like, I, I love them all. But the one nice thing with that is the receivers on the 1301 are very, very short. Um, you know, you look at it compared to, you know, any pump gun. Yeah. You know, I reference it in terms of, you know, the QDCs on the side of the guns. Um, the QDC on the side of a 1301, the back of it actually hangs off the back of the receiver just because the receiver is so short. And in that, you're cutting down your overall length considerably. So you throw on a shorter stock. And now, you know, your full length 1301 is several inches shorter than a lot of other options out there. Um, you know, man, I'd love to see Beretta work some magic and, and come out with, you know, a, a 14 inch a 1301 or something like that to play with. But, um, you know, in, in, in terms of what I personally have, uh, you know, the 1301s are the shortest shotguns that I've got. And, you know, so that's right at the 18 and a half inch spot. So between going from a 14 to an 18, what kind of pattern dispersion differences have you seen? Is it negligible? Do you notice it? In the Van Comp guns, we have the same guarantee of a 10 to 12 inch shot pattern at 25 yards with any good quality ammo. So um, yeah, the 14s are great. I've actually a couple direct messages on Instagram. I, I love it. If anybody's listening, send us patterns. Or they look, it, we love to oh, see the cool. work. So. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I just had a guy today. He goes, I don't think this is bad for a 14. And it was like an eight inch pattern with that green hole Winchester at 25. Mm -hmm. That's not bad for a 14. We're going to need to send that one back. We're going to need to take a look at that one. <laughs> not really, but yeah. So the the, the thing a lot of people need to remember is like you take a Remington factory SBS gun. It's a modified barrel. It's a modified choke, basically fixed choke. That is probably at depending on that day, that build, that barrel dimensions, all the factors that go in, that's almost too tight a constriction for a lot of buckshot. And it's going to blow that load very rapidly out of that barrel. And it's probably going to cause a lot of pellet deformation and crushing and causing the pattern to open up even somewhat more, depending on the type of buckshot and the size and the anonymity and the hardness and all this stuff I have. One of my SBS 870s that the best it will do with flight control at 15 yards is eight inches. Where the other one does really good with number one buck flight control, but not double odd buck flight control. But yet that same gun with Remington nine pellet does really good. So like, like seven and a half inches or something ridiculous like that. So again, no rhyme or reason, but again, I think a lot of that is over constricting the shot column or the buck shot because of the larger size of the pellets. Versus if I throw number four in it, it tightens up pretty good. So variables, it's all a variable, especially when it comes to choke constriction on these guns and the type of buckshot. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That's, that's one of the things we see with different types of ammo. Like um, most 12, like nine pellet double out buck is stacked three by three by three um, right. and three pellets simultaneously can't leave the, the aperture of a 12 gauge barrel, 730,000. <sighs> 729 three triple lots or three double lots don't work it's like three stooges trying to fit through the same doorway so the really the great stuff one of the reasons the eight pellet flight control is so good is because it's two by two by two by two so you get all eight pellets in two at a time and they, they fit right through that not to mention flight control is essentially a sabode slug a sabode buckshot load but you know because they're not really touching that but as long as they don't deform you know it, it's good to go if, if you were to drop a bore micrometer through a van comp barrel you would read about 20 thou constriction, which most shotgunners will tell you is a modified choke, but it's not exactly that because we do that behind the choke. So the last two inches of that barrel is what it is. We just make the back of it bigger. So by, we effectively make that a 20 thou constriction, which will get you something like a modified choke pattern, but it's, it's not a modified, like Steve saying, modified is normally too aggressive for buckshot. Um, and that's why those, you know, a lot of the 1301s, Langdon's the tacticals they're coming with like an improved cylinder, you know, choke or is that right, Adam? They're like, are they all I see or <laughs> copy? 
I think so. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know. Um, I haven't gotten my hands on any of the Langdon specifically. Um, you know, in terms of my particular guns, they're the first generations that don't have chokes in them. Copy. Mm-hmm. Cool. Good for you, man. I, I, I really think that, you know, Brett, I should think about making a non-choke. Oh. Like yeah, that's a long story. <laughs> the, the other part of that too is why I like an 18.5 ish barrel is the gradualness for the shot column and dispersal. It's not as abrupt and sharp as it is coming out of a shorter barrel gun. It's it's got more of a gra- I wouldn't say gradual slope to it, but just an ease of the pattern leaving the barrel and its constriction over a little bit slightly longer period of time. It's not as sharp and abrupt coming out of the end of the gun. That is a big one too. So as far as shells are concerned, so we kind of talked about barrel length and yeah. <laughs> shells are concerned. What are you guys finding to be the most, I guess, reliable, consistent quality? Because, yeah, we, we, we've already established there are so many variables, but there, I know for a fact there are certain brands that are just absolute crap no matter what. <laughs> Name yes. Royal that's easy. Remington. Last summer, I hit a batch of Remington slugs that were loaded sideways in the hulls. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That sounds awesome. I've got pictures yeah. of them. I can share them, but I, it's, yeah. it's not making this up. It's people are handing me like, hey, is this right? No, that's, that's not right. Um, you know, outside of Remington's QC issues, I've always liked either their number one or their eight pellet load. Uh, I have a lot of the older stuff stacked up. I will tell you for the most part. So I have, it's not a thing, right? It's just part of my job. I have about 30 some variations of fighting quote unquote shotguns in the armory. Okay. Black aces has been horrible. Uh, Wolf is just wolf. It is what it is, what you get. Fiocchi, uh, they're normal whatever they have that new dynamic defense load that's not bad it's pretty consistent uh rio forget it i use it for recoil management only that's about it it's all over the map either numbers and patterns totally unpredictable in every one of my guns totally unpredictable winchester silver box walmart big box store nine pellet is still across the board, one of the most consistent buckshots I have in unmodified guns. And I just, I have no explanation for it, but you get their Ranger light load and it's terrible. It's everywhere except for two of my guns. And it's just totally unexplainable again. Um, What I have seen that's been interesting to me has been Herders. Herders has done pretty well in the last three classes that I've seen with students bringing it. And this noble sport Italian fragile stuff. (laughs) It's spicy. Have you seen the Stars and Stripes? No, I haven't shot any of the Stars and Stripes. I keep thinking about buying some because I see it everywhere. So I keep thinking about, okay, I will. I'll definitely pick some up here in the next week. And the other one, though, that, so one of my main go-to loads for a lot of my shotguns, pump or semi-auto, has been the Hornady Critical Duty Critical Defense Black hauled, eight pellets, 1,600 feet per second. (laughs) That load is just magic in every gun that I shoot and keeps a very respectable pattern out to 25 yards. And at 10 yards, it's almost ideal, for my personal feeling, for a home defense load. Yes, I've been very happy with it. It's it's a bit looser in my van guns, but it's it's just fine in my 1301. And like you, I like the little bit more spread that I get yes. from that. Flight control is not the answer for everyone. I've said this till I'm nauseous as well as you and some others, and I get beat up on it all the time. I'm like, I don't care. So, you know, I don't have a YouTube channel with 80 billion people that tells us, you know, from the top of my lungs. It's, it's fact, though. It just is. And I, th- I know you weren't able to be on last week, Steve, but I think that was some of the things we were talking about was that – almost a concern of have we gotten too tight in yes. some cases to where yes. we're we're losing 
the benefits and the advantages of a shotgun in certain circumstances. Mm -hmm. Absolutely 100% in agreement with that. Very cool. Adam, you were just shooting, weren't you just testing some ammo with your charging handle? You know, your secret charging handle that you've been uh, posting about? It's on social. It's, it's not, too much of a, not too much of a secret anymore. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, we were mostly just trying to actually run lighter loads just to see if we would run into any any issues there, um, you know, in terms of, you know, extra mass on the bolt, you know, causing any issues. Um, man, you know, just talking in terms of ammo, I mean, shotgun ammo, there's there's not a good spec for, for <laughs> shotgun ammo or for shotgun shells. You know, the, the OD of one is going to be different than the OD of another, you know, the length of one is going to be different than the length of another, um, you know, cheap bulk bird shot is kind of like the, the bane of my existence in terms of the QDC, for example, you know, simply because, you know, we'll have the spring retention set based around, a quality smooth shell, but you know, this cheap bird shot that flares up around the crimp. Well, that flare is now a, a pain, you know, in terms of, you know, getting it back in and out. Um, yes. I mean, you know, just shotgun ammo in general is, is kind of a, it's, it's a whole topic on its own. Um, you know, in terms of boy, what I've used, I mean, I, I've, I, used, I haven't really been able to find it anymore. I used to really like the like the cheap estate double Ottenbach. Um, I used to get a, you know cases of it through Midway. I don't know if it's really a, even around too much anymore. That stuff performed great for for a really long time, especially in terms of something that was inexpensive. You know, it, it would pattern well enough. You know, it, especially in terms of something that you know you may or may not want it for um you know defensive purposes but in terms of you know training and recoil mitigation and everything it was it was really great for that in terms of my own use uh you know i take the easy way out and i just go with eight pellet flight control um works great in every gun that i own you know i know it, it's it's very very predictable for me you know across the board but uh uh, I've also had pretty good success. <laughs> well, I mean, I guess it depends on definition of success, but, uh, you know, for training, I've, I've always really liked the, uh, the S and B double lot buck as well, although it's, you know, it, it's a little dirtier. Um, but you know, you know, my local gun store, they had S and B, I think it was the rubber ball. I just thought, Oh, I need to get that. That's just fun. So I bought several boxes. <laughs> that was a Have shoot. It. I haven't shot it yet. I need to find the right people to shoot at. Okay. I mean, no dibs. Yeah. It's still considered deadly force for those of you following along. Oh, sure. Fact. Yeah. Fact it is. Yes. <laughs> yes. I was just, we're, uh, we're coming out with our extractor for the 870 and I was doing a bunch of testing of different ammos. And the one failure we had, we did a thousand rounds, um, was it was ammo related. It was a, a Fioki bird shot. And it, the shell stripped right on the um, the extractor cutout on the barrel, and it so it pushed it mounted up plastic directly in front of where the extractor would grab onto. So the yeah, the channel the shell goes in and the on the barrel it just shaved it off, and so the extractor couldn't grab onto anything. That was the only the only type of ammo we'd shot a bunch of different different ammo that day, um, but yeah we've seen. We're just doing an extractor because of the expresses and people don't like the metal injection molded, you know, min thing. So we're, we're messing around with the 17 dash four stainless on 3d printing metal additive machining. So it's pretty cool. Cool. Yeah. Uh, Cody, is that something that would be hardened or is it just, Ooh. you know, right as it is? Yeah, it's hardened. They go in 900 H on it. Okay. Yeah, there she is. Oh yeah, and you can see that syntax. What's that syntax label? <laughs> I know what that is. <laughs> Dang, I almost, I almost wore my syntax shirt on this podcast. I was Whoa. this close. Rob oh, was in the chat with us. He just couldn't Rob, make it. Yeah. Oh, darn it, Rob. Yeah. That's good. So awesome. if I understand correctly, we, we've talked about barrel links. We've talked about ammunition. And uh, if I don't know, if I understand correctly, 
it's up to the end user to figure out what works because there's not a straight across right answer. Huh? Yeah. Uh, yeah unfortunately, I, yes. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and I, I've I talked mean, to I talked with Cody about this, but I've got two Vang 870s. They're probably eight years apart on the machining. They are radically different in performance, and, it, and it's not that anything got buggered up. It's just there's that much difference between the barrels, right? Yes. And I, you know, I've got the Mossberg that I just got done by him last fall or early, very early this year. It's real close to my original, like 1960s Wingmaster that I had worked up. Um, and I can't wait to get the Beretta from him, but, <laughs> you know, they're all di different. And those are guns worked on by the same place, right? But they're still different. And now if you take a look at the stuff all the way across the board, bought wherever, whenever, you're going to get even more variation. Well, part of the variation, though, is because of different zip codes. No. 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 <laughs> you know, in, in terms of uh, – sorry, go ahead. No, no, no. Oh, in terms of every gun being different, you know, on my end in particular, it makes it a huge challenge. I'll get people emailing me asking about how the Crom will co-witness and they'll ask, oh, is it an absolute co-witness or is it a lower third co-witness? I was like, man, I, yes, it, it'll probably co-witness one way or another, but man, it, you know, it even, you know, my two 1301s are built very close together. And, you know, they look drastically different looking through them just because every single gun is going to hit different with every single ammo. And, you know, it, like you said, at the end of the day, you know, each person has to go out and figure out what's going to work with their specific gun, regardless of what, you know, any of us on the piano or anywhere on the Internet says, you know, you got to you got to test your own stuff. Yeah. I and, wish. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead. Sorry. I was just going to say, and, and really that's, that's, that's for pretty much everything, but even more so with, with your shotgun, because you can't just assume, well, you know, this is, this is going to be, this is going to perform really well because I've heard good things. No, oh, shoot it. Make sure it performs well. Steve. I wish ghost rings would just go away. I wish ghost rings would disappear from the face I like the hot Main mods. Leaf. Steve, like do you think that everything should just go to the, the hot mod rifle site setup or what? Either, either more of a rifle type setup, right, with a wider notch, would be great. Um, because obviously, like the Remington rifle sights and most rifle sights are too tight because they're designed for precision at distance. If you actually understand how to shoot a set of rifle sights or ghost rings in close proximity, you shoot off the front sight post. You ignore the rear ghost ring. Got that. Comma, if you take Remington rifle sights or most of the others and you take a chainsaw file through them about four passes to open them up into more of a deeper V notch, you get a little bit better use out of them. The problem is like the Italians, their ghost rings suck. <laughs> The Beretta Benelli garbage sights are fragile. The three millimeter screw up front for adjustment sucks. It's almost <laughs> as bad as the original freaking scatter gun technologies falling off the gun and requiring one screw, of course, adjustment. The LPAs are better, comma, they're still a ghost ring. The other ones that are just even more worse than all of them combined are the Mossberg strings. Yes. You have to, you have to like lift the ramp up. You have to turn the knob. They suck. And yes. None of these companies would listen. Even when I sat down with Beretta and told them their baby was ugly and those sites were stupid for all the reasons why. Going back to the original Super 90s. But the engineers know better than us because it's worked for so long, but they never shoot the shit anyways or use them <laughs> properly anyhow. Sorry, hands off. You're dumb. Hey, don't no. you apologize. That's why I come in. <laughs> no need to apologize, Steve. <laughs> You're solid on that. I'm not going to actually. I didn't think well, you were. Steve, oh, we Steve lost died. him. 
You know, I can only imagine right now what it looks like. He is driving down the road and his truck is stuttering. <laughs> and sometimes it just freezes in the middle of the road. How does he not get hit? I don't know. I, I don't. Maybe he phases. He's phasing. He's phasing. <laughs> it's phasing. Adam, are you personally attacked? He, he was calling engineers uh, just slim. Uh, he's I, a uh, hockey player. I, I, I'm not an engineer at all, so no, I'm fine. I, I said, leave me alone. I'm <laughs> Is this peak? Is this what peak performance looks like, Fisher? Ooh, peak performance. <laughs> what is that? Look, that's those will fall right off, man. I don't know. Don't look don't at like it, funny. It. Hey, I asked somebody oh. to build me a Mossberg with pistol sights, but the rail got in the way. No, that's true. That's true. Your rail. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Yep. I, you know, I'm I'm a little bit biased to a certain degree because I had. Cody and some guys a bunch of years back do a site modification for me. And they're amazing and I love them and they're great. Are they are the answer to everything? No, absolutely they're not. Nothing is, but they're a vast improvement over what we've had on shotguns. Because you have to remember, Ghost Rings game came about because why? Well, dudes were taking old Williams receiver sites, putting them on shotguns from the Remington rifles from the 760s and the 76s and the 7600s and the 740s, whatever, and putting them to their shotguns for more accuracy with slugs because bead sights sucked playing Kentucky windage. Mm -hmm. And that even goes back to the days of freaking, um, God, when Lazzarini was doing them, but before that, Steve Wickert. Yep. The Wickert sights, which, which I still have Wickerts on guns, nice. right? So, and those were actually a good ghost ring. <laughs> the Wickert sights, I actually like because of their simplicity, right? And their, their form factor. Are those closer to your eyeball than the like the, the LPAs and everything? Yes. Because so of the more space, of a you can set them back on the hump. Mm -hmm. Okay. Gotcha. Yes. So you don't even like ghost rings when, when they're ghost rings. They got to be peeps for you to like them. I, 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 honestly, like <laughs> I, my one of my first 1100 set up for killing animals had that Williams rear sight set up on them. Right. Nice. And, I mean, we're, we're talking like sage guns, right? Sage shotguns back from the 80s, you know, mm -hmm. early 90s era, even before that, with this being done. I think back to the old Remington, what was it, the 88 humpback gun that had the flip up Williams peep sight on it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. There, there's a lot of ingenuity back in the day going into these guns to make them more accurate as far as that when shooting a solid projectile. Mm -hmm. But the current trend still of ghost rings all suck. The LPAs are <laughs> your, your guys' sights are about as close to good as it gets. The rest <laughs> are horrid. Well, I mean, the, the only defense of that is that some people. So there's, you know, you've got the red dot. Red dot fixes that. The, yeah. the idea of the ghost ring, like you said, Fisher, your your focus, it's a hard front side focus, so the rear yes. just blurs away. So if you have the time to take the shot, you can remove, you know, move your focal plane back to the rear sight, get that hard right. picture, and then you use track that ghost as it disappears and transitions to your target. Mm -hmm. but, but because of that, it's not fast and it's not as precise as it could be. So I agree that there's there's a shortcoming. It's a compromise like everything. You, it's faster yes. than a bead, or sorry, it's it's faster than rifle sights but it's more precise than a bead site. So correct. that's why we do them, you know, and Adam's, yeah. Adam's got them on the crumb for, you know, cause people yeah. need them. People want to, want to iron back up to electro optics. How, how, sure. I don't know. I, just, electro I don't know. Electro optics. I think systems could be better. I know. Yeah. God, that was terrible. <laughs> wow. uh, no apologies. I read that article of shooting illustrated and I loved it. Oh, I, 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 I like the crumb sites. I've got them on three of my 1301s, which I'm not going to get into right now. I have them on some 870s and, and they're great, right? They, they absolutely are, especially with the hot mod where they're cut in half. Mm -hmm. So you still have a degree of precision like buckhorn sights on a rifle. You still have speed. It, it's great. It, it absolutely is a great system. In general, ghost rings are stupid, and they have no place in most fighting shotguns today. Just saying. Cool. House gun, I need a bead sight. And it's the only place where big dot sights should exist <laughs> is on a shotgun. Up front, ghost ring, big dot, night sight. Only place they should exist is on a shotgun or a dangerous big game gun. That's it. Pistols, forget it. Sorry, Jaeger, you're wrong. And I tell him that to his face, so it doesn't matter. Well, and that the thing is, that's exactly where they came from, was the dangerous game yeah. rifles. 
Sexly Express. Welcome to nineteen nineties. But man is the most dangerous game. <laughs> Stop. I've never been run over by a human being. I was really yeah. worried about that Cape <laughs> Buffalo running over. <laughs> Nice. Yeah. Well, not since I school football. Let me put it that way. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, but no, like sighting systems the, the, outside of electro optics, right? Outside of having red dots on guns, which you've had for years, you know, form factor, they're getting smaller, they're getting better. Yep. I, I think there's a place for them on shotguns, uh, mainly in a lot of low light conditions with white light applications in law enforcement, especially. Mm-hmm. I think they're outstanding for that. I feel that as, you know, especially as either us, others involved in that world get older and the eyes change and our ability to see in the darkness changes, henceforth more white light, we need a better sighting system to deal with that. That's why red dots make logical sense on that. Do I need one on my house gun for 10 yards, my Surefire 618 foreign? Hell no. I need a big dot sight on it. Yeah, fair. And that's why we, on the sites we built for you, they were pistol sights on the long gun, right? It was, we, you're like, hey, put Trijicon HDs on a shotgun for me. Yeah. So we did, right? We dovetailed your vent rib, and then we put the bases on, like we did the sites that Hans actually invented for the DEA way back in the day with excess sights was the low profile rifle sights. So it was a modified Remington front sight, sweated this thing off, and then put a, a 1911 dovetail right here. Yep. So we could get low pro. And that's how we built Steve's sights. The first, the original, the ones that he has, that he has on the plane barrel. It's, um, it's actually an excess or actually it's a Trigicon HD. I think it's a six hour front sight and like a yes. block rear or something. And it, yeah. so we had to buy two sets of HDs to get it done, but Fisher loves us anyways. So the, the production hey. unit will be a little more unified and those are coming. Nice. So do you guys actually do business with Eridus at all? Because if you don't, you should. VanComp? Yeah. No, no. <laughs> no, uh, presently we don't, but that's just because we Mortal have enemies. Had... Not at all. <laughs> yeah, I love you I too. love Cody. <laughs> yeah, we had him. He was the first the shot show he went to. is in our booth, yep. in our, on our yep. table. We've, so the QDC was the, the other side of the coin for the detachable side ammo carrier. Wait, so, Adam was on your table, like with the sushi on him and that kind of thing. <laughs> Ooh, that's we, we should have done that. Spicy. No, what a missed know. opportunity. <laughs> Next year, there's always that's next good. year. That's true. Uh, yeah, we had a table in the the Surefire booth, and our shotgun was there, and I was there hawking the wares, and and you know Adam's like, hey, can I bring one of these by? And I'm like, come on by, man. Let's put it on the demo gun. So we got to cool. see it, and yeah, we, I mean that type of stuff. Hans was always about, you know, taking care of people that were coming into the industry. We never really had the means to do it, except for the connections that we had. But now with the new owner, Mike, he's even more about cross-pollinization and then making sure that awesome. everybody comes up together, right? The rising cool. tide rises all ships. So, amen. I mean, yeah, in the future, yeah, amen. In the future, for sure, we're, we're, I want to work with Adam a lot. And We got each other's numbers. We're good. Yeah, for sure, for sure. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it, like I said, that, that QDC, at the very least, it's the other side of the coin for the, our detachable side ammo carrier. So we went first with the plate um, on the gun, so you didn't have to stick Velcro to the side of your gun because armorers hate peeling that stuff off and reapplying and putting rubber adhesive. So we put a sacrificial barrier as a plate on there and then had the removable shell cards. So we worked with three gun gear to make our first six rounders and then wilderness took over the manufacturing from them. So the wilderness is making our shell cards. Now they've been making them for the past 11 years. And so when, when Adam came to market, you know, people were asking for a rigid version. They're like we want a, a detachable cyan ammo carrier, but we don't, we don't trust the Velcro or we don't want the elastic. And we're like, well, our elastic isn't the same as all the other stuff. And they're like, it's, we just don't want anything soft. And it's like, okay, there we'll, we'll think about a hard one. And so the thoughts on ours is always, let's just attach it to a card, you know, like the tax star plate, have that on there with some sort of latch mechanism. And then here comes Adam with the QDC and it's like, Hey, that's one less thing we have to do. <laughs> Take it away, Adam. Yeah. Can you, no, I mean, can you get some more yeah. D sacks out that Adam can go ahead and talk. <laughs> yes, oh, <sir>. no. yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> No, I was just going to say that was my first year at SHOT Show. I mean, that was pre-production. Um, or, or no, actually, I, I think that we had finished up taking pre-orders, but it was before anything had ever shipped. You know, first time ever meeting anybody. Of course, I've known of, of the Incom forever at that point in time. So this would have been SHOT Show 2016. And uh, 
yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, got to meet Cody and, you know, next thing I know he's telling me, yeah, bring, bring part, part on Bible, put it on the gun at the, the booth. I was like, this is so cool. <laughs> <laughs> so it was, it was really neat. So, we, I mean, we've had a great relationship ever since then. Absolutely. Yeah. No, no hard feelings in any sort of like any competition is good for everybody. And, and it's like, we're, we're kind of in separate lanes, uh, definitely, you know, for now at the very least, I, I don't plan on doing anything for 1301 until I have a barrel system for it, but it's not stepping on any toes of Adam. And then hell, if it winds up stepping on toes and it can save me development time, why don't we just brand it with Eridus and be like, Hey, here's my input. What do you think? Just go to market with it. That's, that's the, what Van Comp, the future of Van Comp is collaboration for sure. Cool. It, it's it's kind of funny, a little bit unrelated, but I, I sort of made the comparison, you know, probably even within the last week or so. You know, I you know, I'm a 36 year old that still plays, you know, hockey with a bunch of buddies. And, you know, uh, you know, some teams I'll play with some friends and some teams I'll play against those same friends. And, you know, you know, we compete at the end of the day, you know, we're all just looking to do our thing and you know, get along with each other and make each other better. And, you know, honestly, I kind of feel that a lot of the industry, I mean, at least the good guys are, uh, are the same way, you know, it's like, you know, yeah, they're, we're, we're separate companies. We kind of do different things, but at the same time, I think we're all rooting for each other and, yeah. and, uh, yeah. you know, pushing each other to be better. Except yeah. none of us are pushing for police one. <laughs> There's a story there. That's just because uh, Warren isn't on with us. <laughs> nah, so I think something else came up of late too. I think oh, really? Finally, finally starting to kind of catch on to the editorial slant. Oh, gotcha. So for a defensive shotgun, and this is something we've covered in the past, but we might as well discuss it again. What are the needed accessories? White light, number one and only one. If anything, white light, period. I won't argue with that. Yep, absolutely. Has to have a light on. Fact. Well, one of the things that was discussed uh, the last shotgun episode, which was talking about the law enforcement shotgun, specifically talking about the Benelli Super M1 Super 90, was mm. the fragility of the system, where if you have certain things <laughs> mounted or too many things mounted, it may not yeah, run be. white. Yeah. Yep. That's where Wolf came into play and built the plus power spring kits for that gun. And I think that originally came out of one of the big LE courses out at Gunsight back in the late 80s, early 90s. Yeah, that wouldn't surprise me because the real heavy knock on the Benelli's when I was a student and I first came on staff was the inability to run more than one accessory. It didn't matter what it was. If you went to two, that gun was hosed. And we had a class was when I was apprenticing with some guys from Glendale, California PD out there with mm -hmm. Benelli Super 90. That's it. And they, because Mario Marchman and Bill Halverson, who were on staff, had come from there. They could actually run lights and side saddles on their guns. Whatever had been done to them, they could run both. Is the same problem with the M4? They no. fix it. Cool. Yeah, this was a this Cat system versus inertia. Yeah, this was an early Super ninety thing. Yeah, the, the Super nineties being an early inertia driven system, it threw off yeah. the weight balance ratio of the system working to the recoil, and to get it to really work, you had to run full house buck. Like you couldn't run then the 12, 1300 feet per second, which really isn't wasn't even low recoil then. So you had to run full house big boy ammo. And I'm pretty sure it came out of that course, another history lesson in life, you know, that Wolf came up with the plus power recoil spring setup, something, something for the inertia system that allowed them to keep then laser products devices, four ends, not mm -hmm. surefire, laser products devices. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the tech star single screw, I think it was side saddle on that gun. Yeah, I've got some insight into that, actually, on the, the demo for that. The Secret Service wanted to pick those up, so they had a demo at a Camp yes. David. And the hands was out there with the shotgun and 870, and they're talking about throwing projectiles. You know, the question was, emptying a 30-round MP5 mag or just touching off four rounds of buckshot? 
So, uh, you know, to deliver those 30 cal projectiles on target. So, um, they were, they had a contest to see who could do it faster and hands beat everyone with the pump gun. Yep. And so they let the secret service guys shoot them. And they're like, we like these. And the Benelli guys like, no, 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 no. You shoot this. This shoots really fast. So they were <laughs> pressing the trigger and the guys, the Camp David guys, secret service guys, they're, they're just built like, like brick shit houses and they're shooting the gun. Then it's not running another round because it's got it's stuff hanging off of it. And the, the guy, whoever he is from probably HK or Benelli at the time, uh, was like, no, no, no. When you shoot it, you have to move like this because he was shooting it, absorbing it, not letting that inertia move the gun at all. So here he is telling this guy, the secret service guy, you know, probably just a total meat eater. And he's like, no, you have to move like this. So, and Han Hans just has that story. I, I really like that. Yes, I remember that hearing it from Hans. <laughs> yeah, twist like this. Okay, I'll do that every time I press the trigger. Sure thing. Yeah. Well, and that's exactly why I have an HK marked M1 Super 90, and that's why it's collecting dust. It should, and it's a great gun. Oh, I'm sure. I just have... I have an H and K. What is it? One twenty one Woodstock, basic. You know the nine shot, whatever it was I that H and K came out with. Uh huh. Cabela's four hundred and fifty bucks about ten years ago. I should have bought every one that they had. Gas yes. was five cents a gallon. Yes, it was about eighty nine, probably. Yeah. So well, I, I wanted to go with the the Rhodesian Browning. So you know, <laughs> there you go. That's that's a win. That is a win. Did you get that? It's an auto eight or something? Eight round A5? Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Mm -hmm. Nice gun. So, I remember. Oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. Go ahead. You're good. Nothing. No, I'm going remember? to a tangent. tangent. Do it. No, no, no. You have something that's important. No, no, no. It's okay. That's, it's, it's, don't worry. It's irrelevant to your tangent, Matt, please. Okay. Um, what about calibers? So gauges, 12, it's not a caliber, yeah, it's a yeah, gauge. Gauge. Get it right. This is a high Matt, gauge Matt, discussion. Matt. It's um, not even a gauge in 410, it's just 410. It's true. So well, I'm thinking more of uh 20 versus 12 versus <laughs> oh because I remember someone versus 28. Yeah. Eight versus 20, yeah. Because yeah. I remember Trek had a semi-auto 20, 20 gauge, and that seemed like yep. so much fun. I didn't know how applicable or how viable it would be the, the, the problem ammo. with the 20s is ammo go ahead eric sorry no i just good no steve go ahead because i'm just gonna have one side of it go uh ammo right ammo selection is very limited in 20 for very viable defensive ammunition okay got it on the other side of the coin is there's really no benefit due to Velocity, mass, energy, putting it in a lighter frame gun, which creates as much recoil pretty much as a 12 gauge, almost foot pound for foot pound of felt recoil. Less projectiles. Come on. <laughs> Stop Doesn't it. Don't make me come over there. The, the only benefit we ever saw with it work wise was we had one extremely petite female coming through the yes. program and who could it. pick up and run a 20 gauge because of the weight. The shoot but, it all day. But Yep. When you put a 12 gauge in her hand, there was that much of a weight increase with the recoil that yes. she could not physically run the gun. And we had it all set up. The office was going to buy her a 20 gauge and we were going to have it worked up. Uh, when she came off the program, she could not make the training program. Um, mm -hmm. But we identified this like in new deputy orientation. We're like, okay, how are we going to solve this? Because we're either buying her a nine mil sub gun <laughs> or we're buying her a 20 gauge shotgun. And it was easier. Nine mil sub gun. The 20 gauge shotgun was an easier <laughs> sell at the time. <laughs> yeah. Well, you, you know, and I think part of that is this as well, Eric, you've seen this and I'm sure some other guys here, it's a balance issue as well. Um, like compactness of the gun. Like if you gave that same individual, probably a 14 inch SBS gun versus an 18 inch gun and maybe balance it out with a slightly shorter stock, turn it a little bit more compact, you probably wouldn't have the same issues. Yeah, we actually had that as an example, not to interject here, but we built guns for Alaska Fishing Game, and they were 14-inch mm -hmm. 590A1s with 10-inch Hogue stocks. Yes. And that's yeah. because of the shorter shooters, um, you know, shooting with Heavy a winter, winter parka yeah. on top of body armor. And so, mm -hmm. but it's kind of like what we were talking about when Rhett was here, um, that, that sort of positional thing. And I know Fisher's supposed to shoot with the buttstock on your 
your pectoral, but that's Fact. what they were, they were getting behind that to, to present the body armor to the threat. I don't, I don't know if grizzly bears care about body armor, but who knows? Yeah. Steve, why are you opposed to that? One, it only works for certain demographic. Two, women have breasts. They get in the way of mounting shotguns. It doesn't work for everybody. It doesn't work repeatably. And it only works squared up. And it doesn't work for shooting on the move to the offside, the other side. And it doesn't work in off-access positions. And it's something made up for flat range standing there shooting a gun bullshit. Well, that's a pretty good answer. Thank you. It's, it's fact. <laughs> Don't sugarcoat it. How do you really feel? <laughs> it's exactly what it is. It's ridiculous. <laughs> Sorry. Next. <laughs> real, real quick on the 20 gauge stuff. Gellhouse, you may have seen this also. There was, there used to be some competitive shooting stuff at a gun site with pump guns. And mm -hmm. they used to have this big, like a, like a three inch diameter steel pipe. And they used that, they hung it on a chain. And that was mm -hmm. like a, the stop plate for a, a string of fire. And we did a we did a twenty gauge for a couple of folks who used to run the I Core tournaments. Uh, Art and Jan Leach, and so Jan had a uh, she had a twenty gauge eight seventy. It was a Vancom, and everyone would run those plates and then hit the stop pipe, and everything was cool until she ran it, and she shot all the plates and hit that pipe with her twenty gauge with buckshot and knocked it over. Mm -hmm. So the thought, the bro science on the range is that a twenty gauge shot string is longer. So it pushes the pipe for more time hmm. as opposed to a 12 gauge where they all arrive about at the same time. Mm -hmm. so it was an interesting, interesting thought. I didn't know if you had done any science or research or anything or any, anybody here. I don't do science. <laughs> I, I do weird nerd science, but I, that one I haven't seen now it's almost interesting enough to try to figure out a way to play with it, but I don't remember seeing a stop pipe. Okay. Okay. Cool. Mm -hmm. I just, just thought I'd bring it up. It's, yeah. it's interesting. You know, you think of the, you know, the pool ball effect, the multiple projectiles. When Rhett was here talking about projectiles hitting flesh, yep. it was hitting projectiles. Yeah. You know, uh, Bill Jeans referred to it as this, the synergistic effect of multiple projectiles at once. So, yeah. yeah. Um, the difference in what Bill and Rhett are describing, if I understand Rhett stuff right, because they've been force fed by Bill, is Bill was looking at almost a wall of pellets hitting. Mm -hmm. where what it sounds like Rhett is describing is you catching the end of a railroad tie. Mm -hmm. Okay, sure. Which so is like that railroad games. tie is the stack of pellets, mm -hmm. whereas Bill was talking about a wall of pellets, if For that sure. makes sense. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, and that would, to me, logically, and, and you know, with different high speeds so that we've seen, that happens to be normally the speed of the shot column coming behind it because – if you're pushing the ass end of that shot column through the rest of it, because you're getting more speed through it. And we've seen that on high speed too. Um, it's pretty cool to see. We've seen that are, flight control open, like inside are you, of like, are, you know, So are you seeing a wall or are you seeing the railroad tie? Well, it depends on where in the target, the difference, if you, if you were to measure it at different points between the muzzle and a backstop, you'd probably mm -hmm. see a few different shapes. Okay. Yes. Yep. Um, I would be interested in taking a look at some of that stuff uh, offline if at some point. Uh, well, I'm going to put up a, a lot of that data is going to go up, uh, especially the sound readings, because I want people to be informed like we were. You okay. know, the, the logic was always if you want a, a quiet shotgun, that's why I we went to Silencer Co. You want a quiet shotgun, don't port it. And that's just because mm -hmm. that's what it is. And we could all tell that. But we didn't have empirical data on it. And now we have it. Go figure. A ported shotgun negates the suppressor in sound dampening, but to shoot right. a, a 12 inch suppressed ported barrel, it's a different, when you're talking about, Rhett was talking about the slap that you get on that right. first initial push of the big pressure spike of the gas port, you know, for semi-autos, stretching that over a longer timeline. That was uh, that was pretty interesting. The, the guys who were doing the testing for us, I think I've got them on video saying, that doesn't, it seems like it's broken because the, the ported barrel with the suppressor on the end of it, it, when you know the kids these days they say it hits different it right. literally <laughs> hits different <laughs> it's pretty cool so what lights are you guys using and are there lights that are not surviving <sighs> okay so yes let's get rid of olight right off the get -go. <laughs> thank you thank you so, eric just for shits and grins last year i did a demo with an olight the second round I fired caused the entire mounting system to unlock and eject off the front of the gun. Mm -hmm. um, that can go away. 
don't hang pistol lights on the shotgun. As, please, mm-hmm. especially not a Streamlight TLR1 with the screw down locking mechanism mm-hmm. off that bayonet mount that you will drive your thumb into painfully cycling mm-hmm. the gun. Um, I, I've got a mix, and I, and I don't know what Steve has, but I've got a mix of Surefire and Mod Light on my shotguns. Mm-hmm. So I have kind of the same gamut, right? Um, the Surefire DSG, the block is garbage. Um, it's it's horrible in functionality and design, and its weight is horrible on the shotgun. Do not use that. I hate it. Is that that, um, is that the replacement for the the H series? Hand, it was hand. the original replacement for the six eighteen okay. and three eighteen yeah. gun, right? For the six eighteen three eighteen. Just to correct you, Steve, DSF, dual switch foreign. Thank you. Dual switch foreign. Thank you. I think DSG, I think dual something shotgun, whatever, and DSG out of Texas. Sorry. Um, too many acronyms and initials. So that, I think, also forced the rebirth of the 618 or the 618 and the 316 lights, which the, 36, the 318 is the executive light and the 6 is the one-inch tubes, whichever the numbers are. <laughs> Best shotgun light going, hands down, unbeatable, perfect for a house gun, working police patrol gun, bomb proof. Have not killed one, tore up one switch a million years ago on an early model, got it. Best dedicated shotgun for and going, the Streamlight Racker Cracker is terrible. Um, <laughs> a lot of unintentional negligent light discharges when you don't want them. Form factor is great, price is great, makes it very affordable to people who may just have a shotgun stuffed in the corner. And I would say, sure, departments will buy them because they're cheap if they're still employing that on a slide action shotgun. That said, on some shotguns, pistol lights aren't necessarily bad depending on the placement. And if you just roll the rocker and go back to the forehand, not the best form factor, not at all. Uh, Mod Light has some things coming here very soon that uh, will help enhance it. I have seen guys attach Mod Lights to shotguns off Scout-style mounts, and they do not handle the recoil well with the original batteries. They flattened right out, as I've seen with Cloud Defensive as well, with the rechargeable cells, protected, unprotected. See some weird stuff. Shotguns are violent. There's this thing with recoil. I would personally, and and this is the problem, right? Finding a good light for a semi-auto shotgun, especially if you're running a 1301 with the Aridus form, with the adapter, with the Magpul Zukov stock, great setup. Absolutely great form factor for that gun. The problem there is once you apply leverage, you break the light out of those M-lock slots. You need to, that has been fixed, right? Some of us and others who figured it out you need more surface contact at the rear of that setup or else the leverage applied and those principles under recoil will send that light off that gun. How do I know? Ask me done it a couple of times. It, it's, it's what it is. So by changing the nuts and a few other things on the back, yeah, we get more surface contact. We kind of eliminate that problem. I'm sure some enterprising shotgun company probably has a better fix than that. Um, I might say Vencom probably thought of something too. I don't know. Pistol lights, are good form factor on the 1301 setup. They really are. If it's an X300 or a mod light, I have seen enough stream lights still launch with that thumb screw design come off the gun. It just doesn't lock. And it has a tendency to vibrate loose sooner, much like they did on handguns and launch themselves off pistols on a range. It's just the nature of that animal. Okay, great. If I was running a dedicated 870, 590 gun, it would get nothing but the, the Surefire 4 end light in either the 618, 316 series. No ifs, ands, or buts about it, period. It's heavy. It's bulky. Lift things. There's a, another benefit to the 618 style of lights. Uh-huh. If you look at Rob's push-pull technique, as yes. you go forward into that yes. forearm on the surefire that hump that drops down that the light and battery screw into gives you a place to push against yes right. um i know matt you matt you were holding up your one of your pump guns with the mag pull 
um, hand stop on it. That hand stop works well if you're using the Magpul forend again to roll into it, similar to the light and battery housing on the 618s. Yes. There is another benefit to the 618 series and the 3 series is when you violin load the shotgun while moving, you can maintain situational awareness of what you just shot, shot at, and that immediate area while moving, rolling the gun, topping the gun off of what you fired, and maintaining the light in that zone. Getting That's a constant true. stream of information. That's because it, it's at six o'clock. So does that work with every other six o'clock position light? Only six o'clock position lights. Generally, you can get away with it, but the problem is toggling some of the other lights, mm -hmm. pistol lights and that. When you roll that gun, depending on their placement, if they're direct nine o'clock or 1130 positions based on the mount you're using, you can get it to work. The six o'clock light mount position works beautiful on a shotgun for various techniques. Agreed. Yeah, I'll step in real quick just from a commercial side. The white lights are a problem on pumps right now because the stream lights, you know, 150 bucks on Amazon. Um, Surefire's now, so Surefire discontinued the 623 light for the Mossberg. Uh, so now the only Surefire option for Mossberg is the dual switch 4N. Um, the Surefire for the Remington, the 318 is gone, but they do yes. have the 618 LMG-B. Like, yes. like Fisher said, it's a, you know, it's heavy, it's bulky. It's also expensive. Now, I know how Fisher feels about pores, but um, the, <laughs> it is a, it's a $600 <laughs> retail price for that light. It is. And that's, it costs that's as much as a shotgun. Tag. It does. Um, so you can find them on Amazon for like five thirty, and we're van comps we're a value-added reseller with a uh, surefire so we can gobble up some of that price to buy a new gun from us which are, are coming but uh to answer the question i mean what's what's in the gap what's the 300 hundred dollar gap for them it seems like scout light you know clicky tail caps the uh, zx2s yes. even mm -hmm. g2s like old stuff um the, and that's the mosberg i got oh, sorry yeah, go cody no just the mosberg i've got on this trip's got a p2x fury <laughs> Yes. You know, on in a, a ring mount? pole forearm. Yeah, on a ring mount on a mag pole forearm. Yeah, mm -hmm. so it's and, hard to tell. Yeah, and that was one of the things that, you know, being in an agency where we issued everybody their own shotgun, cops were cheap. And we couldn't <laughs> get the agency to ever pop for lights, no matter how much we explained the liability of running around with long guns with no lights. Yeah. But the mag pole forearm and a P2X Fury or something like that was, was a viable patrol shotgun setup yeah when we couldn't get guys to pop for the overly the overly expensive yes. surefire one size fits all answer so now yeah 160 bucks you got a you got a white light a ring mount and a moe for it yeah. The mag plus yes. yeah so that's yes. kind of what we're telling folks too and it's it's tough i mean i as strangely enough i'm gonna i'll come out i think it's a safe space um i like the enforce the wml i like the switch on that especially for a shotgun mm -hmm. um it's just right there it's a pressure pad you can toggle it to momentary i just wish it was made of aluminum um because a lot of people are breaking switches on them the, the actual the mount for the picatinny rail clamp um that part's made of plastic and if that hits on anything solid more solid than the plastic it just goes away so that's we talked about that's my this. piece I don't think I've ever heard anyone refer to a primary and secondary modcast as a safe space. <laughs> it's my first time. I, I yeah, thought. I definitely don't know. not. Definitely not safe. <laughs> okay. Um, if, Co if Cody thinks this is a safe space, let him yeah. think that. Okay. We won't we, <laughs> strike that. So <laughs> I found I, I found that this light really doesn't work well for shotguns. Okay. If you guys are messed with it at all, no. uh, the Z Bolt Blazer because oh. it's essentially a laser. Hell yeah. Ugh. My head hurts. Smart ass. Yeah. <laughs> God, I hate those things. What are you? What are you seeing, Adam? What's uh? What are people putting on the Zukov up there? Uh, you know, a lot of people are asking about uh, Scout lights, um, but also, you know, there's uh, man, I've I've run a lot of handheld lights, um, you know, just uh, in rings. I'm trying to think. Uh, Odin Works makes a really nice offset M lock mount. You know, I've used uh, some of theirs. I really enjoy that. But yeah, for for a little while, I kind of you know made a step over into some Chinese handhelds. And uh, I'll tell you what, I've I've 
put a lot of rounds through a, a Phoenix TK 15 on the, on the shotgun. And I mean, you know, for whatever it is, thousand lumens or whatever, you know, at like 75 bucks. I mean, it, I mean, I still haven't killed it. Uh, it's, it's actually held up surprisingly well. So, I mean, you know, for your know, budget conscious options, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a fan of handheld with uh, clicky caps. And that's mm-hmm. in, how, how are you holding it and how are you switching it? Um, magically. I I, yeah. I wish I would have. No, I should have brought it out. It's not on this gun, but we're just going to pretend for a second. Okay. Let's pretend. Yeah. So, you know, the offset would send it hey, somewhere around that. there. Okay. And, you know, so I just hit it with my thumb and then kind of get my thumb back out of the way. I, I personally, I hate mountain stuff on shotgun handguards. That's kind of one of the nice, nicer things with this is it gets it further out front. Um, you know, on, especially like on a pump gun or something where it's further back under recoil, it just beats the crap out of my hand, which, you know, I don't, I don't love that. So that's also one of the reasons why I like the offset mount a little bit more, um, just to put it up a little bit higher. So I'll just reach up with my thumb, click it on and then get back out of the way. Um, Adam, not like you don't have enough stuff to build in or anything, but have you (laughs) thought about machining like an oval shaped or racetrack shaped washer that could go on the inside of the Zukov forearm, but with a cutout the full length of that channel so that when people put the end locks in and twisted them, they're not twisting them and torquing them against plastic. They're torquing them against metal that spreads it out over that whole space. So I've had a couple of people ask about, about things like that. Um, There is, I'll just say there's something in the works that will make that not a problem. Okay. And and that's also one thing like we fail to realize, like in the early days of this game, especially at certain department levels, they weren't going to spring for all these lights for 30, 40, 50 shotguns. But what they were springing for was the streamlight end cap mount that went between the locking end cap <laughs> yep. and the threads. That was $11, and they were taking their X300s or whatever and slapping them on there. I still have several of those on a lot of shotguns because they're a $12, $15 option yep. to just take your whatever pistol light and put it on that gun at a 6 o'clock position or whatever. All right. Um, and then those were those were pretty pretty viable options at the time, even though they would bend easily if snagged or smashed into stuff. And they're basically held up with one screw to this piece of bent sheet metal. But they're still I, a good viable say, option for a homeowner. I would say too, though, it's never a good idea to take up these threads. Yeah. So yes. anytime because, you can avoid putting something behind there. Yeah. Because we saw the separation under Rico of them not locking down in the threads and the not walking off and then the barrel dislocating, much yeah, like the Remington two three piece Mac two. There's maybe two and a half threads there, three yeah, threads, yep. maybe? and you're going to take up yep. 120 thou of that. That's that's a half rotation at least. And if they didn't yep. have the detent, the ball detent in there, yeah, in that mount to meet yeah. up with the ball detent on the barrel hanger. Oh, yeah. You had the likelihood yeah. of it walking off. And yeah. the, the reason I argued against it when we first started talking lights was I saw enough of my folks forget that those were there Ooh, and run yeah. the thumb full speed forward <laughs> yes. and bugger up their thumb Whack. really nastily. And now we've got blood everywhere <laughs> on that one. And that yeah. was, that was the biggest reason that I was arguing against that. So one of the options I found that I'm a big fan of, and I primarily got it for my ARs because most of my ARs are M-Lock. It's the KD, KDG uh, Connect. Mm-hmm. It hasn't broken off the Magpul yet. It's not nice. saying it won't, but essentially it's just a QD. We have the Magpul uh, M-Lock slot right there. You snap mm-hmm. it into place, locks into place. Hey. It works. We, we ran, like, I have a 1301 that's pretty much own stock gen one gun that has a piece of picatinny rail screwed and epoxied to the forehead out at the farthest extremes that I can put it on there. Right. Like, like that was the original solution before Adam came along. And even then on the 1100, 1187 series of police guns, that was an option. 
uh, guys didn't want to spend the money. Like I would, I would pay money right now to get another 1100, 1187 surefire four end if I could find them. And I've been looking for a while and I can't. And, you know, you can get creative with it with some epoxy and a couple of screws and a chunk of a pick rail on a gas gun. I'll caveat that. The, the thing I like about this specific setup is though, that I can, uh, depending on the gun I'm using. So let's say I don't have throwaway income and I, I can only get one good light. I can move this to my, to my AR or whatever weapon. So easy. Sure. Sure. That's kinetic development group. I have a is bunch that, of these and I really like them. Matt, is that's that, is that but it's not too far? I'm sorry. Well, I'm, I'm tall. And so your thumb outboard. Okay. Yeah. Have you shot with it that way? Yeah. That's so that's one of the things that we got to do in the, the bill jeans. I took the Morrigan consulting shotgun class is one of my first like actual certified shotgun classes. And we did a nighttime shoot and it was great to see different types of switches and how you can reach them in different stages of loading and working a pump gun. Um, with semi-auto, it definitely seems a lot easier. Yeah. Um, a little a bit more because things kind of stay put no matter where you are in the, the feeding cycle. Um, but yeah, that the, the offset on that kind of reminds me of what a clicky tail cap looks like on top of the scout mount, the plastic MOE scout mount. So like for me, it was my thumb didn't go far enough outboard to kind of click it and still have my hand in a nice position but that's good huh yep and specifically the one so i just provided the link in the chat and this specific one is the connect universal 45 degree offset mount so it has nice. pick and it also has uh, scout screws cool and with clearly mod light clearly but also that's a, that's an interesting aspect of, okay, we're using shotguns. They're not necessarily going to be a, a long distance. They, they're a longer than pistol. At what point is too much light? Is there too much light? I don't think there is. No, 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 no such thing. Now, in, I don't remember what episode it was, but Daryl Bolke brought up this really, really cool concept of kind of social camouflage. Mm -hmm. And the idea was he had some form of a hunting shotgun, which was essentially it, it. It looks like a hunting shotgun, but you could it's still something very viable for for defensive purposes. Yes. Um, yeah, because it has it's painted woodland, not woodland. What is it? It would be. See, I don't hunt. Real so tree. Don't. Yes, real it's, tree. It's some real tree timber line. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's some weird. It's some weird Daryl thing. It's Daryl. What does he know? Nobody exactly. Cares. <laughs> no, he, he's a 400. Um, and so th yeah. to me, the coolest aspect though, is that's potentially a 50 state gun that no one's going to pay any specific attention to. Whereas if, if this is in my trunk, people are going to go, well, wait a minute. That doesn't look like you're not going to be hunting geese with that. You could. So I'll oh, tell yeah. you what mine is. <laughs> mine is a Winchester model 12 takedown Woodstock blued finish gun chop to 18 and a half and a beat site installed. And totally benign gun, totally benign gun. Grandpa's shotgun. <laughs> yeah. That, that comes into play on uh, talking to Alan Normandy, you know, from battle Comp. Oh yeah. 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 Alan's awesome. I'm sure he's a friend, a friend of primary and secondary. Oh, yeah. He's Very one much. of my mentors. I love him. Um, so he was talking about the, you know, since this is the civilian, you know, using shotguns for Joe Schmo, why does that make sense for home defense versus other platforms? And that's, so we had a long talk about it and we talked about, you know, the idea of your neighbor hearing, you know, a commotion and 25 shots out of an AR versus a commotion and one round out of a shotgun. And um, like you said, uh, you're not going to make news headlines likely, you know, a man killed by a shotgun, you know, Versus yeah. AR-15 is evil. Killed with an assault yeah. rifle. <clears throat> exactly. Yeah. So I mean, yeah. that's just. Uh, I mean, if we're talking about the civilian use of a of a scatter gun, that's that's one of the reasons to go for it. I think, like Steve's saying, I mean, you know, in a motorhome, traveling around, houseboats, fifty states, yep. you know, tube fed, no pistol grip, you're probably going to be fine. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, that's my buddy's life. You, you know, one of my good buddies who's retired spends 
part of his life on a boat and the other in a motorhome traveling the campgrounds. You know, that that's that's his go to choices and loaded with number four buck. You know, that's, you know, a, a four and a half foot shot. I mean, it's just it's ridiculous, you know, when you think about it. But I want to get into stuff that breaks on shotguns because I've got a laundry list like Eric does. I'm certain. <laughs> go ahead, Steve. <laughs> Let's let's start with side saddles. <laughs> not the Eridus. No, not the Eridus. Nope, not the Eridus. No, but let's talk about the Tech old Star. stuff. Let's talk about Star. Let's talk about early Mesas. Let's talk about some of the other ones, right? I, I mean, they were prone to breakage, and when some of them broke, you had a single-shot shotgun. It, it and done. you get, in addition to that, you got into use, lack of user maintenance. Bingo. Right. No, no understanding that with the recoil of the gun, if you don't tighten the screws, keep them tightened, use a thread locker and mark them. Yes. So you can see when they're rolling out, right? Now you start having those things fall apart or loosening up and that weight slamming back and forth on their, you know, while we're out the halls, I'm sure that's everything else in the threads. Or did I freeze? I I, Eric, yeah, Eric, I think you just caught Steve's internet. Okay, yeah. So I froze for a bit there. So what'd you say? And I'm back to freezing. Ah. Oh. So, so the problem with a lot of those were, right, you, you needed user maintenance, right? You, you needed to make sure they were smart. He's uh, messing with us. He's got to be. That no. If I could mimic it right now, I'd do that just to be a smart ass. But I, yeah, I'd laugh. I think I'm back now. Yeah, yes, you are. Maybe. Okay, good. I think I'm back. So the issues were user maintenance, thread locker, maintaining the tension, proper tension, because when you just torqued them down, you clamped the receiver and then the shotgun wouldn't work properly. Yep. You were actually crushing the receiver under tension with a lot of those screws. And like even some of the early Mesas, they were breaking the slave screw that went through to the two pins. And then the side saddle would swing and fall off like the tax stars did as well. And then you had a giant single shot shotgun at that point. There, there was a lot of issues that people didn't understand the way recoil forces worked against screws going one direction versus things going the other direction. Um, Tagstar also had like an aluminum plate with a polymer with some really little thin, thin thread screws mm -hmm. that often strip and rip right out of it. And then your side saddle would fall off, but your plate would still be attached. And that's where Velcro three gun cards came from. Yeah, absolutely. I can vouch. We, uh, we, I was part of that development at a gun site. Um, I was making the plate. It was, you know, seeing all the issues that people had with other side saddles. Like Steve was saying, the, the all thread screws would go through and on the Remington and the Mossberg, they've got a retaining ring in the middle of that shaft. So when the all thread screw comes through it, it's like a saw across it. So as it gets maintained, you're actually breaking that D ring on the inside of the trigger groups. So we wanted to make a screw that didn't have all those threads. And then we made the screw to the tolerance of the receiver so that you couldn't over tighten it. It would just bottom out. And that's, that's that. And then our steel screw went into a steel escutcheon, an, an insert inside of the aluminum plate. So there's no steel on aluminum that would easily strip out or have a chance to over tighten because it's all thread or strip out from the carriers. It was just steel on steel inside of aluminum plate and you're good to go. Was it, it Cody? Sorry, Cody. Go for it. Was it, uh, so this is a throwback. Eric would remember, I remember. You probably were gonna know this. Remember when the T type pins came out from Scattergun Technologies? Mm -hmm. yeah. I think it was Randy Kane. Sure. That had those screws where it had the cutout like the trigger pins. Mm -hmm. Yes. In the yeah, screw that's... body to prevent that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what our, our side saddle has those reliefs too. So that even if you lost the plate, I don't know how yes. it could happen because our, our, our inserts are pressed in from the other side. So the, the screw grabs it and pulls it in. So there's a big mm -hmm. flange on the back side here. So it, it can't fall off. If you lost it or just wanted to get rid of the plate, your screws, our, our side saddle screws still had the recess on there to, to hold that awesome. D-ring. Yeah. Yes, absolutely awesome. Hey, and, and speaking of Randy, it's nice to 
see Steve mention him. I think I brought him up at the start too. Randy yeah. does not get near enough credit. No, he for does the not. Work man. He's done for the work wow. he's done with shotguns. Um, if there's a direct and descendant of Louis with the shotgun, it's Randy. Yeah, Randy Kane. Fact, two hundred percent. Randy doesn't get enough credit, period. Yep. And Randy's just that quiet boy who likes to trout fish, right? Like it's Randy, you know. <laughs> but like Randy with a bolt gun, I don't even want to stand like and do that fight with an AR against Randy with a bolt gun, especially <laughs> in his heyday. Randy would oh, run yeah. three to four rounds with a semi-auto. Yeah. Scary dude with a gun. Absolutely phenomenal man. Phenomenal dude. Can't give that man enough credit in life. Incredible, sure. incredible teacher. Still based yes. out of Colorado? No, he's down in the south. He was out of Tennessee, and then he's somewhere oh, down farther south now. Sorry. Yeah. Oh, I was yeah. thinking of Colorado. Uh, that's where we were sending some guns. We actually we took over making his ARs when Robar stopped being a thing because Freddie Blish was close with him. So uh, we yes. were doing ARs just branded for Randy yes. Kane. And we, that's one of the things we want to do later um, mm -hmm. is do his do a shotgun for him too for his his curriculum for his school. So got to get in one of those nice. classes. That'd be awesome. Agreed. Yeah. So the, the other big one, right? Always breaking. Knock stocks and Blackhawk recoil reducing AR stocks on shotguns. Are those still things? Thank God we don't see much of those anymore. Though I still see them show up. I, I, so this year, uh, some guys from 77th Division showed up out of L.A. with those on their shotguns. Oh. Oh, no. We oh, put them on I mean, to a bunch. I mean, the gunfighter division. The gunfighter yeah. division. They still had some of those floating around, man. We, we did. A, they may have some ATF buybacks. Like the last ATF enforcement contract we did, we put recoil reducing stocks on 18 inch guns with no tube extensions for, for just slug guns. We, yes. we tried to talk them out of it every step of the way, but I don't Horrible. know. Have, <laughs> Matt, have you gone through that on this, on this before? Why reciprocating things on things that recoil heavily are a bad idea? <laughs> Actually, I, we might've in the shotgun episode. I don't remember if it was a personal conversation. It all just meshes together, oh, but maybe we should talk gosh. about it anyway. We could, I uh, just, just think about a, a shotgun and this is a, this is that's all I've been gun. thinking about. Yeah. All right. So this shotgun, you learn to shoot it and you learn where, where this is as you shoot it. And then your, your gun's recoiling to the rear. So that stock absorbs the receiver, the receiver comes into it and it travels to the rear so that this spot where you run the gun reliably back to eject the shell and load the next one, because that is where everything is down. Now that spot has moved to back here. And so as you learn to run the gun faster and you're, you know, you remember where that action was. Now it's the short stroke and short stroking. Yeah. Yes. So, so you can watch it yes. happen. Gun site, like I said, that's where we cut our teeth. This, is this episode sponsored by Gun Site? I don't think so. It but, should uh, not yet. Not yet. <laughs> it should be. We'll, we'll call we'll call him up. Okay. Sheriff Ken, what's up? Uh, so yeah, we, we just watched it happen, uh, after lunch break on the second day, people would start having those short stroke malfunctions. You're getting, yes. you know, they, they know what they're doing, getting into it. Like, oh, I, can, I can actually run this thing. And then wait, what's going on? It's jamming. Well, that reciprocating stock moved that point where you're That's done interesting. And when they broke, it was usually the latch for the adjuster. So when it broke, <laughs> yeah. it used to pinch your cheek and cut your cheek open. Or it would leave the stock attached yeah, to your cheek and the shotgun hanging by it. It was a weird. <laughs> yeah. I, I oh, guess it was we did enough. I guess we did a good enough job telling people how stupid they were at work because I don't remember them breaking that way because I don't yeah. think we had that many of them. <laughs> yeah, they, they were terrible, man. They're they're absolutely horrible, horrible. And to boot, the angle of them, much like a pistol grip stock, changed the cheek weld. So guys were smashing their faces in under recoil with them as well with heavy loads <laughs> and slugs. Because yeah, but their shoulder's cold. fine. Yeah, but the shoulder was fine, but your you're you just fine. got punched in the face by Mike Tyson. <laughs> and you'd hit this big goose egg on your chin, on your cheek from them, right? And then it changed the way you read your sight, so everybody was shooting the guns high. There you go. Yeah. They were the, the most horrific idea in the world. Terrible idea. <laughs> For the love of God. That's another one with the ghost rings that needs to go away. <laughs> and then... Oh, the Remington factory two-piece mag tube male-female connector. 
Mm. Almost every course, when people don't check tightness, it starts to wobble, and then it jettisons off the gun as they run the pump forward, and then the barrel comes off the gun. Yes. So what was more common, that or people coming in with unzeroed rifles? Ooh. Oh, that's about a 50-50. <laughs> oh, God, yeah. Horrible, horrible ideas. So are you guys... Oh, go ahead, Eric. I was just say, we didn't see it on the older guns. Um, right. But we started seeing it for us on the, like the 04 and beyond guns. And we bought a bunch of, bunch of, well, shit, we bought about 300 of them in 04. Those, the breaking the ejector housing. Oh, yeah. Yes. Right. And ending up, so you would, the thing would get broken. The barrel would twist inside the receiver. We'd had, we'd had mm -hmm. a bunch of other issues. I was amazed at how many of those we broke. I can't tell you how many we sent down to Cody's oh. shop to have them Countless. fixed. Countless. And that's I never saw it on time. the older guns. Never saw it on the older guns. Yeah. yeah, I think that mostly came from the way that the the receiver was cut inside for that the barrel lockup. Okay. Let's see if you can mm -hmm. see inside of there. Because the tighter that stays and the more true that shoulder is, the less anything can rattle and walk and snap that ejector housing. Oh. So that was a fix that we were doing with um, – I think it was Little John at the Department of Homeland Security, uh, National Armory, Altoona, Pennsylvania. Okay. Um, we were going, we were developing, and we had a couple prototypes of a solid nosed ejector uh, that would fix that problem. So, being stronger, even though these are still riveted into the guns, um, that, that solid nose was enough as opposed to a stamped one, the, the U shape that they have now. Um, it, it wouldn't shear, it wouldn't tend to shear as much under those same forces because this this is where that happens from, yes. that little rattle. So um, if you make sure this is tight, and that's one of the reasons we're talking about that, one of the reasons Steve hates those tube extensions because <laughs> as soon as all this gets loose, you know, there's a there's a couple turns and now, now your barrel can just come off the gun. Yep. That's not good. So, uh, yeah, they, they, we weren't able to do it again. One of the small business, you know, capital constraints that we used to have, um, R and D didn't go fast enough for DHS. So I just gave the design to the DHS. They gave it to Remington and now all the new Remington's come with solid nose ejectors. Oh. That was a fix that they put in back in 18, I think 17, okay. 18, all the way across the board from expresses to police magnums, uh, solid mm -hmm. nose ejectors. So. It's okay. We didn't give them all the juice. There's still there's still some stuff we're gonna do to make them a little more user serviceable. So that way you don't have to send it back to the station. So like one of the best things to come out of one of the best things that came out of Fang besides all the obvious stuff is a very unobvious piece that a lot of people never saw, and that was the I think it was the DEA or DHS program that had the button for the safety, not reversed, so to speak, but the large head was on the onside. So it was larger to push the safety back onto safe instead of fire. That was the best thing in the world that I love <laughs> on my shotgun, ultimately because most people screw up putting the safety back on. Especially wrong handers, right? Or sorry, left hand. Being, well, left yeah, hand. absolutely. But pushing the safety back on with certain techniques, the large head safety as it was built traditionally had the button on the opposite side of the receiver for putting the safety back on and finding it easier. Yeah, we did that for Department of Energy, actually, DOE. It was DOE. Yeah, okay. um, that was, I've, yeah, have you seen that, Eric? I've never seen that, but I, I, it, I want to. It's, a, <laughs> yeah. it's amazing, okay, Eric, you, you need one. You They're need coming one. back out. Uh, you can't see my whiteboard from here, but yes, that's one of the things. This, that's okay. a VC 114L. The so most for, amazing thing for an 870. Yeah, we're we're gonna make them again. We got a lot of people. I mean, I'm sure that you guys have talked about this on primary and secondary before, but you know, ARs and shotguns are kind of you know trading places as far as you know what's mm -hmm. the magnanimous long gun. Uh, so now. Uh, breachers is what we're seeing a lot of law enforcement and military. Um, that's what the gauge is for. It's for getting into denied access, right? Ballistic breaching. So um, in that vein, breachers love to be able to put that thing back on safe pretty quick. Yes. If you, you know, blow the hinges, blow the knob, do whatever, and then uh, just put that thing on safe and rack it. So um, we're making those again, especially for that. 
So yeah, that'll that'll be yes. about uh, probably about six weeks out. I'll need five down. more. You'll see my order coming in. <laughs> yeah, you'll see no mine too. <laughs> Yeah, we'll put Dude, them out. Man. Show that to people in class. They lose their mind. They're like, oh my God, that's genius. I'm like, yeah, it is. <laughs> it's not genius. I mean, it's, it just happens, no, it's right? genius because it solves a lot of problems that people have with traditional behind the trigger guard yeah. safeties. Mm-hmm. Finding the button in the notch of the stock to put the gun back on safe. And you're asking them to to follow to follow that thought. You're asking them to do stuff with a hand that's not normal for them. Bingo. In, in an area that they can't see. Right. If they're looking at it, they can find it. But the problem is we don't want them looking at it at that point. <laughs> True. Right. So yeah, giving them something big that they can find and activate mm. works perfect. It's a, it's Eric. It is the best thing going. I'm surprised you didn't know about that. Ha ha. No. <laughs> I'll send you one with your 13 and one barrel, Eric. <laughs> oh, okay. So in other words, next year. <laughs> no, 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 yeah, probably. <laughs> Ooh, shots fired. Hey, hey, I'm still waiting three years on my shotguns. No, I'm kidding. I <laughs> the only reason I'm giving Cody crap is because I sent my gun oh, the wait. same time that my barrel in the same time as some guy who has a big YouTube channel. And uh, he got, he about got his. He'll tell he you got, about that YouTube channel too. Every chance oh, he gets. Yeah, he will. And, and he got his back. Like, and I still haven't seen mind but it's okay because i haven't had to write cody a check yet either <laughs> that's, that's right. we, that's okay. we just ran out of reamers man the, I that's, know. that was our, yeah. our experimenting of chrome lining was was messing with high-speed steel uh going yeah. to carbide so yeah. um yeah. we had a bunch of older high-speed steel reamers that didn't fit the specs that we needed so uh for for our production stuff so we're like oh, let's test it with uh, chrome lining and yeah, we ran out of old high speed reamers before we got to Eric's barrel. But there's a few people out there kind of alpha testing this, I guess beta testing. We, because we did our own on uh, Benelli M2, Benelli M4, 1301, and then the Stogram 3000. So we got, there are Ving barrels out there for those now. And then we've got some beta testers helping us with the 1301 a little more and Benelli M2. Yep. Hey, yep. for the folks out there listening, if you guys don't know this about Adam and Cody and the folks that work with them, they legitimately <laughs> go to classes. They yes. run their stuff in classes. Yes. They're seeing how it holds up and they're adjusting it from there. And, and I can't speak as much for Adam as I can for Cody on this, but I was in a hot class, Rob hot class last fall where Cody and GT were running all the semi-auto guns. Yeah doing the fit, doing the fixes and the evaluations on the barrel work. So we actually got to see them doing it real time. And so the people that are here talking about it from the business side of things are actually out getting the training and getting the trigger time to put good stuff together. That's the secret to making good products. Yeah. But I want to acknowledge it because we know not everybody does. No, we absolutely. Yeah. Speaking of black aces, um, No, no, no. No. Are there brands that you guys would tell people not to go for, for uh, defensive purposes with a shotgun? Yes. Oh, like what? Anything Turkish made currently. Okay. What about the cry thing with the 12, the revolver? No, stop it. Stop it. We don't like revolvers here. Or double A12 or or an AA12. I take one of those. Um, I've seen a lot of Turkish guns come to classes. Sorry, Eric, go ahead. No, go, go, because I'll follow on Uh, something else. Yeah, a lot of the Turkish guns I've seen over the past couple of years have fallen apart in heavy use courses, okay, which are firing a lot of buck and slug. (sighs) Unfortunately, that's their thing. Now, this last class, I just had one of the Turkish clones of the Benelli M4 that held up well, but it granted it was only 225 rounds. It's not a big metric for one. Um, even some of the Stevens Savage current guns that I've seen that are Turkish, I've seen two that did not survive a course. They're very hit and miss. That said, if you get one, for the average person to have as a home gun for a $250 shotgun that's going to stuff it full of shells and throw it in a corner and maybe fire it five times, it's probably going to do just well. It probably will. Over the long haul, serious end user, doubtful. So I picked up one of the Turkish shotguns last year. Um, Mm -hmm. SDS Imports ART2, I think is the model on it. And what I did was I took it down to a Rob hot class. Um, 
tried it tried shooting it one afternoon and it, it just wasn't there because stock was too damn long and it was just edges too sharp on it but where i'm at now is i've got about 425 rounds of buck slug and some bird through it uh the the, the optic space sheared up, came off of it because the screw the teeny tiny screw that was like uh tax star length size that was holding the mm-hmm. optics rail on failed but what that did was it allowed me to get an actual point of aim point of impact with the gun not some weird screwball <laughs> thing um if i could shorten the stock i wouldn't be opposed to that being a home defense gun for the kind of people that steve was talking about All right like if you had a thousand bucks bought one ran through a couple cases of ammunition took the other one out function tested it and put it in the closet you would be fine Yes. Agreed. Are there any AK variant shotguns that are worth a damn? (laughs) Some very high end, heavily modified ones. Yes. Like guns from Billy Cho or the Tromax guns or some of the R and R racing guns. Right. Even the, even like, um, Oh God, what is his name? Z-Man Alzita. Like some of those guns that those guys have worked over in the three gun circuit, like are amazing. I also know a lot of guys that rebuild those guns every couple of years because of the abuse that they take in the pounding that's put on them. Yeah. But again, you're also talking a $3,000, not an off the shelf arsenal yep. magazine fed AK gun that doesn't feed half the time and doesn't work. <laughs> like a Mossberg magazine fed gun or a Remington magazine fed shotgun which were all dogs garbage <laughs> still garbage uh, i think i've sorry been guys s- i've been seeing a lot of ar looking ones too that's mm. just like uh genesis Other genesis things. is good it's good genesis yes. is good yeah very good that, those were the guys out of ohio correct correct what's the price point on those uh they Unique. sell uppers that'll fit your 308 lower oh yes. Mm-hmm. I tested that gun years back at Alliance when those guys showed up one day. Yeah. They were coming out to the range to do some stuff. Joey asked me to come down being a shotgun guy and yeah. shoot the dog snot out of it and talk to those cats. Yeah. Good it's dudes, a... great heads, and they took information well. Yeah, and they've they've changed it to I don't know how much of the stuff's public, but they're yes. they're I, I don't want to sound like a cool guy, but like I just don't Too know late. what I'm on an NDA with some things. So um yeah. It runs well. It's a 12 gauge upper for a 308 lower. Uh, if it's yes. DPMS Gen ones, Aero Precision, all those lowers, and they're coming out mm-hmm. with a slant back variant, so yes. we'll work on all those too. And yeah, it nice. fits. It's it, your trigger you like, your grip you like, the stock you like. Now it just shoots 12 gauge projectile and payload. So, and it runs well. They, they the magazine was the big thing. It was actually developed by the guy who made. This is a history lesson for some people, but the RAS 12. Do you ever hear about the RAS yes. 12? Yes. So it was a it was a rebated rim 12 gauge. So it wasn't a standard rimmed cartridge 12 gauge. To, to, so it just ran. Uh, it had a shoulder. You know, it, it had spaced off the the taper of the, the shell. So, um, he he saw the folly in his ways of trying to make a new 12 gauge uh, shell standard. So he yeah he just made it work with rimmed cartridges, just like people have been doing forever with 22s and anything that ends in R. So uh, he fixed the magazine. That's the reason a lot of people don't like some Sega stuff and another, you know, Remington stuff. But uh, the Genesis is good to go. Full vouch. It's awesome. It runs with everything. Yes. I've, I've shot a full auto with a seven inch barrel with breach around. Mm-hmm. It runs. Cool. Yes. Going and you can bank comp the barrel. Gun, that gun ran like a dude. The one I tested years back was mm-hmm. outstanding. And now, now it just recoils softer. He put a little, like, a counterbalance thing on it. It's oh, really, really God, cool. Oh, God, because it was brutal in its original factor. Well, yeah, I mean, it's a 6-pound 12-gauge still, but it's, yeah, it's it cool. was brutal in its original factor. Well, I the, so, so I mean, I don't know how much time we have, Matt, but 12-gauge, um, normally tubular-fed magazines, your, your barrel length is limiting your magazine capacity. So stick feds made a lot of sense when you shorten the barrel. So a shorter profile, um, you know, so, like, Cerberus super shorties were like two round mag tubes. Yep. It's like, it's cool, but you got three rounds total. Um, so the box fed mags made a lot of sense for that to me. Yes. Um, and seeing the pivot to breaching, 
in a smaller platform, you've got those little Remington MCSs that are, that are great, but they're going to have four shells only. So you're reloading all the time. Now you've got the option for a little eight round magazine um, that you don't have to reload all the time. And when you're done, you can just pull the source of ammunition and put a new one back in and it runs and it's a 12 gauge. Yes. So, yes and it's it American does. made up in Idaho. Yep. So pretty sweet. Yep. Oh, cool. Uh, can we go back to guns guns that we wouldn't recommend period please yes any of the double barrel double magazine tube <laughs> setups oh that exists i'd have never seen that oh god so the first one was the south african one yep. um which was kind of cool in that the operating mechanism was completely reversed so it was pushed forward to eject pull back to chamber the uh, Neo never saw those come in the and Neo said Mm -hmm. oh. Then you had the Keltec with their KSGs, oh. and then Love Smith eight. and and then Smith and Wesson recently came yep, out yep, with yep. one that I got to shoot a couple months ago, and sure call it chunky, blocky, pop and lock. I, I, I don't know what you say about it. There was nothing smooth about the damn thing except yep. for the outside finish on the barrel. Um, yep. That was a disaster, and it was hanging up. It, nothing ran smooth on that thing. I would, I would not walk. I would run away from any of those yeah. double barrel, double magazine tube guns. Here's and one. Let me just real Go quick, ahead. Steve, on the Tavor. Tavor's got a three mag tube version of that. Yes, twelve or fifteen. If you're around people with it, be extremely careful of it because it's very easy to miss that third tube on the unloading. Yes, it is. And we almost had a significant emotional experience in a class last year where two of the tubes got unloaded and the third one didn't. And we caught it with about two seconds to spare. Um, yeah. I would stay the hell away from any of those. Go ahead, Steve. TS, that TS shotgun, uh, they sent me one to play with. Tom Alberando's a friend, you know. Um, asked me to play with one. Unfortunately, I was right in the middle of my surgery at that point, so I really couldn't do much with it. I've had a couple come through classes. That was definitely a concern point that was brought up. Um, big, chunky, awesome, like looking space age blaster gun, man. Really is. Remember the crossfire. The yes. 556 slash 12 gauge pump action rifle shotgun yes. from North or South Korea, I think it was, or somewhere. That was an interesting gun. The crossfire MK1 or MK2. That was an interesting gun, too, that I was like, I wanted one bad, but not that bad. Um, oh, one one that I would recommend for, I'll, I'll say, consumer users, right, that aren't going to invest a lot of time and energy in, the Benelli M3. Yeah. Great gun. Awesome form function for, for that gun, for what it was designed to do. Not for the average Joe user who's just got a gun. Mm -hmm. And the Frankie Spas, because the Spas 12 is great. And everybody should still have one. That was an 80s dream gun. I love my Spas. It still hangs on the hook in the closet where it's been for 12 years. That's with the, the one hook. with the, the hook for <laughs> yeah. your stock, the hook stock on it, right? Yeah, the hook uh, metal folder that comes out like an Uzi stock kind of thing, you know? Yeah. 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 Looks like the top Great of a coat gun. hanger. Yeah. Yep. Yep. <laughs> That's Crazy how it has gun. it hanging. That's exactly how it hangs in the closet where it stayed with three inches of dust on it. With the umbrellas and. And every sharp edge you can imagine on that sheet metal for it. Mm -hmm. That's quality. It, it was then, man. It was hey, great. They got the same engineer to do the Turkish shotguns. They'll tell you the <laughs> charging on handle on that thing will sever limbs. <laughs> Speaking of charging handles, you know what would be great? Like the next if upgrade Aridus for my 1301? One, 1301? Yeah. Yeah, like a solid one? That'd be cool. I'd like that. You know what would be, would be even better? <laughs> if Brett had customer service. Oh, dang. Whoa. Uh-oh. <laughs> Adam's, 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 Adam's getting something. Screen. Yeah. <laughs> Why is he kicking his pants? Thing. It's Beretta. Oh, oh yeah. You had, a, you had it a... Is. You had a wonderful experience with Beretta recently. Yeah, and I have two 1301s that are down. Gen 1 guns. And they, and in, in their defense, extremely, extremely, extremely hard-used guns. 
well over 5,000 plus rounds through each one. Well over 5K. Perez's customer service ever since Eric left has been non-existent. Oh. But I know why. But I also know why. And I still to this day have not gotten an answer to my emails or a phone call. Comma, oh, no. I finally had to put like a buddy reached out to me from the industry and said, hey, bro, blah, 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 blah. I'm like, yes, at this point, please. We will do this. I so now, now FN, FN is now fixing it? Ooh. No, because no. <laughs> that's where Eric is. <laughs> yeah, he is. He is. Um, but no, but it, it's, it's literally I'm waiting. And they told me it'd be approximately a month to get the part out of Italy for the parts that I need, the parts. And yeah, and because in, of course, European market, the bolt assembly is considered a firearm. Mm-hmm. All the red tape, baby. All the red yeah, tape to go through. Pressure bearing. And that's those welds broke, right? That's what the, the yeah. welds on the carrier. The action bars on the weld too that holds the bolt carrier and bolt in place broke. What are you what are you doing for that, Adam? What's next? You're gonna make your own yeah. an extrusion well, or yeah, you got an enhanced bolt carrier system? What do you got, buddy? Yeah. Talk to us. Ooh. Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll put it on my to-do list, you know. Ooh, I'll get working titanium, on it tomorrow. Titanium action <laughs> bars. <clears throat> So, Steve, yes, you know what the problem is? The problem is you're not my guns. Well, no, no, you're not <laughs> listening to our president because our current president says all you need is, is a double, double barrel, barrel shotgun. shotgun. Yes, a shotgun. Hey. just two blasts. Hey. Get a shotgun. There have been plenty of dudes that have earned an e-ticket ride out at gun site with a side by side with extractors and or ejectors. Very nice. But Adam did Eric. say he is not making any accessories for a side by side. No, <laughs> he sucks. I could have told oh, you that. Yes. Not even a crom. This is old news, Nothing. Steve. This is old okay. news. <laughs> it's okay. It doesn't matter. And again, it's not it's not Eric's fault. It's not his fault. It is a I, hard use gun yeah. that broke because I they think, don't break when you use them. Yeah. I think he does make something for a side by side. Because I think you could put a universal QDC on the butt stock of that side by side. That's true. true. Yeah, Actually, That's yeah. Really Yep. I just I just thought of something that might be useful to people listening at home that still need to get some training. How do you have the mm. side saddle set up? Oh, tricky question. And for why and what? <laughs> well, he's thinking mine has radically changed. I mm. used to run everything brass up, right? Uh-huh. Because I would come over the top of the gun. Yes. Butt stock in the pocket of the shoulder, come over the top of the gun and feed. Mm. I have made the switch to the violin loading. So yes. now I run everything hull down, uh, brass oh, down oh. so that as I roll it in and my hand comes back to grab the bear, the bag tube right in front of the receiver, I'm just hitting with my middle finger, pulling it down and shoving it in. Yes. Yep. Bingo. Yeah. I mean, I've played with a bunch of different things, certainly, especially considering early testing was literally all on shell carriers and uh yeah me it is all brass down all the time you know it's uh you know way better i don't think that anybody would dispute that it's way better for loading up your tube yeah and you know depend you know pretty much the matter if you're i'm holding it like this pulling with my weak hand I throw it up on the shoulder, pull from the strong hand, brass down is good. And then, you know, for me personally, um, you know, even on your emergency reloads, you know, you you can come under. I also like, you know, doing my my emergency reloads with it up on the shoulder like that as well. All of which works great with brass down. Assuming your shell carrier can hold the rounds mm-hmm. brass down yep. without and without protect and still protect the shells. Yes. What I, I think happened and we kind of talked about it on, on the LE shotgun episode was you, you had the influence of LAPD coupled with the early side you know, shell holders that didn't in the shells as much so having the brass up holder where they weren't falling out right and i yes. think that as we've gotten stuff better gotten better quality stuff we're realizing that they're staying the holes are the shells are staying in even with the brass down and that's been the change 
And my biggest thing with it too is I would rather work with gravity in that instance than against gravity. Not to mention putting optics on top of the box, which can, for some smaller people, have issues of reach over the top of the optic going into the ejection ports or the loading port, sorry. The loading port, I'm thinking AR here. Um, with that, and ultimately, right, we have better elastic now. Uh, wilderness, obviously, you know, makes outstanding elastic that holds up incredibly well over time with the carriers being left loaded. So you don't have to wet them down, throw them in your dryer on super high heat and shrink them back down again, right? Mm-hmm. Um, is that a thing? It was. Yes. Oh, man. <laughs> it, it is. Ask Alan. Believe me. It's a thing, man. Don't do it, it with the thing. shells. <laughs> yeah, don't do it with the shells in there. But, but it, is, it is actually a thing. And a couple of companies that manufacture really good elastic, right? And then Wilderness has a great lock on that for, the, for their elasticity and the way it holds still. Before that, Three Gun Gear had an amazing side saddle that I love. And I still run Three Gun Gear cards to this day on some of my guns still that I have leftovers of on. Because you show all the variants and classes, right? Here's elastic. Here's the Eridus. Here's this, right? You, you give people options. And with that, even the Mesa, which nobody ever read the instructions on, had a rubber grommet that went through it that you would have to rotate occasionally to maintain the elasticity or whatever you want to call it of that or the tension from that rubber to hold the shells in place because they would form with the shells and cause them to lose that tension. People were like, wait, there's instructions on that? Yeah, you would like <laughs> loosen this thing up and you would rotate this you know, rubber piece inside of there to maintain that in a day. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and now we have stuff like Aridus. Yeah, exactly. And now we have Aridus. Yeah, you mechanical know. tension. I like it. Very nice. Yep. And you get to adjust it to whatever size. Yeah. And, and, and here's the yeah. yeah, and that's part of it, right? Is, and me and Adam have had this talk and others, is it the answer for everybody? Not yes. for the budget consensus person. <laughs> Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, hey, I'll, I'll be the first to say that sure. uh, my stuff's not for everybody, but if, no, it, nothing you know, is. if it works if for you, you the best that's great. If not, that's cool, too. <laughs> right. Exactly. And that's just it. Right. But is it the best at it? Yeah, it absolutely is the best at it. It absolutely is. Is it for everybody who has a $240 Turkish gun and six shells in the gun and six on the side? Probably not because they're going to get sticker shot. Right. For a lot of people. For a <laughs> very right. heavy degree. It's their, true. Their bandolier sling will keep them warm at night. That's what I'm saying right there. Mm. <laughs> you know, I'm Settle really, really Pancho excited. Via. Settle down, Pancho. <laughs> I'm right. really excited. My <laughs> bandolier sling is bandolier sling is tell me you've never trained without telling yes. me you've never trained. True. Yeah, absolutely. That's my favorite. That I'm is super, my favorite. I'm super excited for the dedicated uh, Aridus carrier for the Benelli M1 Super 90s. That's going to be great. <laughs> Yeah, it's a big market, Adam. You should get into that. It'll be He's one round because that's all the more weight they can handle. One. Good, good call, yeah. Yeah, yeah. load this only with three-quarter inch slugs or three-quarter ounce yeah. slugs. Yeah, exactly. But, but no, I, I think, you know, people often will – and Eric has seen this. I know some of you other have as well classes. Like, I'll have those dudes that show up with every piece of equipment you can bolt to a shotgun times five. Lights <laughs> – lasers six inches of aluminum plus extended rail for their <laughs> weeping crane death grip whatever on a shotgun and they burn their hand on the barrel because they don't realize it gets hot with an eotech mounted in it and a 204 height unity riser because if it's good oh, on an yeah. ar it's great on a shotgun <laughs> holy mother of god plate carrier no laser. <laughs> oh yeah that, that's because of the molly loops could all take extra shotgun that's right. ammo and sure. every loop yes. is full. every piece yes. of velcro is, is yes. covered Ah, uh, good time. Absolutely, man. <laughs> so, well, one thing I do want to have, Steve, Steve mentioned that two, the 204 height riser, right? Yeah. So <laughs> way, 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 way back when, when I first decided to try, go ahead and laugh, Steve, I deserve it. Uh, when I first decided to try an optic on my shotgun, I took an Aimpoint Comp M4 and threw it on a base of rail on top of yeah. my 870. And God, for the life of me, I could not understand why I just could not run that gun and get a good bound on it and still find the dot and everything else. This was also 2006. Yeah. That was before Adam was born. Probably. (laughs) Probably. I think he was still playing playing peewee hockey then. 
Yeah. But it's called so, Penguin, it, four to six. <laughs> it's one of those things where sometimes the folks who are financially challenged, because I don't, don't want to use the P word, not with Steve around. <laughs> no, I don't care. It triggers them. I know, but it's also too, it's one of those not knowing things, yes. right? Yes. So that's why you have to go to classes. At least Correct. get to at least one class with a competent instructor on Definitely. whatever the yes. platform is. See what because you're going gonna to run into somebody <laughs> who can tell you why that isn't viable. Yeah. Right. That, that, that is part of like my two hour morning lecture and shotgun course about what to put on a gun and what not to put on a gun and why. Ultimately. Nice. Which Mesa rail did you have, Eric? Was that the, the high tube Leo adapter or the high tube? Over the it top? was the one that, that basically was an upside down U. Oh, so you can still see your the ball sights underneath it. Yeah. So it, was, <laughs> right? uh, it yeah. would go over the top with the rail up, rail up on top. Okay. It would bolt left to right, and it had yeah. the shell holders on the left hand side. Gotcha. And it wasn't it wasn't the rail; it was taking it and putting a compound four up on there with a, <laughs> with the base that was designed to go on an AR to clear the front sight. Yeah, yeah. Great for gas masks and night vision use. <laughs> yeah, that, but not so much for a pump gun on patrol. <laughs> is that different than what Rhett was talking about on the AR height mount? What do you think? I think it's ridiculous. Okay. I, I don't know what he's talked about. I've just looked at his use of the bird's head grip mm -hmm. and how he's running that um, in a position very similar to where a stock would be. That's the only okay. thing of his I've seen that, I, that I'm really fascinated with. I heard he was talking to the natural head position and, and yeah, that's not the head exactly upright. how shotguns were designed, right? Yep. The natural head position for shotguns is way down here and, and tracking that beat yeah. or drop it comb. Yeah. Yeah. But when you start that seeing people getting getting beat by dropping their head down to the gun versus bringing it up. That, that's kind of where I'm like, okay, yeah, I don't like dropping the head down because I've seen too yeah. many people go black and blue over that. Yes. 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 Depending on the stock length and seeing if it fits. Yeah. Yes. I agree. <laughs> hey, Adam, there is a topic for you to address real quickly that came up in uh -huh. chat. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, in terms of the QDC, being a good option if you're not going to be carrying multiple carriers on you. Um, so, I mean, the one thing we've addressed is better shell retention. So you're not going to have issues with carrying brass down. Uh, one thing that I learned really early on, actually like literally my very first live fire session uh, with the very, very early prototypes um, was with a four hour shotgun block with Chris Fry. And uh, my, my very first one broke immediately. And I, and I actually had to break it worse just to get it to stay on the side of the gun. And so it was essentially just running a normal side saddle for this shotgun block. And what I noticed is we'd go up to the line ready to run a drill for 25, 30 rounds. And you know, I'd get six reloading repetitions off of yeah. where I would actually be carrying ammo. And then, you know, my other 24 repetitions of reloading are being pulled out of a dump pouch or pockets or whatever. And I mean, at least in my mind, those were more or less wasted repetitions in terms yep. of reloading. Yes. So um, I, you know, if you're taking classes or even going to the range for a training session or whatever, um, it's a good training aid, you know, if nothing yes. else, simply because then you're getting your reload repetitions where you would actually be reloading them from. So, yep. um, you know, other people might have different thoughts on it. That was my experience with it, you know, <laughs> before the, Q the QDC even worked. Um, I kind of realized, oh, this will be good uh, for training just as much as somebody that might actually be kidding up. You know, um, if I've got a shotgun on the side of my bed, I'm not going to be throwing on, you know, a battle belt with extra carriers. I'm just going to have what's on the side of the gun. Um, but in training, it's, it's been nice for that, for sure. Absolutely. 110%. For me, it's also really viable when I'm showing different loads. Because I coordinate, you know, that kid, those carriers are loaded with, okay, this is flight control. This is yeah. Remington this. This is Winchester this. And I've got, you know, X rounds on the gun. Like, okay, these are what these look like at these distances. These are what these look like at this distance. And it's very handy for me in that capability as well as an instructor to just be able to have carriers loaded with various sorts of ammunition on the gun to show students. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, that goes with the versatility of the shotgun. You know, you can yeah. shoot a single projectile or 400 at a time or, or nine. Yeah. And that was the yeah. great thing about those. Most of the time, those are color coded and the shells, so you can see them through the carriers, the QDCs. Are you doing those in different colors yet, Adam? Spray no, paint. not yet. Same, same yeah, with us. We, we just, we're just doing black. Just black. Black is so easy. <laughs> we do black. We're, we're, we're going to do different ones down the road. Uh, there's orange for less lethal and stuff. That's easy right. for us. But yeah, I mean, yeah, if people had their ways, they'd, they'd go all colors of the rainbow, man. So careful. Got to be careful. Oh, but truth. I, I agree. Same, same with Adam. Shooting at a class, uh, reloading the side saddle quickly, as opposed to reloading the side saddle one at a time or loading 25 reps out of the, the dump pouch. So same. Yep. yep. Uh, See so you in know, class, rip it off, slap a new one up there. Now we're doing shoot one load ones again. Oh, and that's an interesting one too, right? That we bring up um, for students of this gun, right? Ammo carriage in a class. You know, backfilling, loading, uh, having more ammo, right? Just bring a shell pouch generally, right? Is always handy. You know, I, I use the dump pouches from Wilderness, their shell bag or whatever that is. I use that a lot because uh, it's handy it's convenient i put it on my belt it rides center line in front of me like i would appendix carry almost and it's just full of shells right so i can constantly backfill or do what else i'm doing for certain demos or whatever the case is uh, end user hard use stuff like between those love them or hate them the john willis cop rig or the micro cop rig is amazing for shotgun for heavy loadout competitors uh, you know if you're not wearing all the belt for twins and quad loads that rig has never let me down over years. It's bomb proof. And again, he was the only one making a solution at the time for that loadout that a lot of guys were running into. Is, is anyone here familiar with Bill Blowers doing the breaching stuff? Who? <laughs> Bill, that guy? Bill guy. I don't know. Bill something. Yeah, I don't that, know. Th yeah that, uh, that, that loader dude. thingy that, with the, that allows you to do twins or quads Wait, if you want is awesome. Easy. Easy eight. The, yep. the I bought it yeah. because of him. We've, yep. we've talked to them for like 10 years. We've been trying to talk them into going big time with production numbers. And they're just like, no, we're just make we're happy where we are. And I'm like, okay. Yep. But uh, yeah, those easy eights are great. Yeah. I, I, he knows how to use a 12 gauge. What? Hey, even the old California competition works loader. Oh yeah. This is yeah, viable the eight for a lot of dudes. Yeah. That's good for a shoot one, load one. Yeah. I like the easy eight. Yeah. And then, um, I mean, when you're talking about putting stuff on kit, those new 511 just re-released their pouch that it was totally like a trap, trap and skeet inspired design of holding a, a literal 25 round box of ammo in a Kydex <laughs> thing with the lid. And, but it works. It's great. Um, we, we've used them in class a bunch and yeah, it's a way to see 25. I could see that on a kit for a guy that really doesn't know how many <laughs> deadbolts or hinges he's going to have to blow off of the off of doors in an apartment complex. I mean, you're just racking that, loading it every time. So yeah, I can see that. Interesting. I haven't seen that one. I got to look at that now. 511 flex. I think they call it flex. F L E X. Look at that. It's pretty cool. It holds on Molly malice. It's got all this, all that stuff. Interesting. Well, they I just re-released it. I, I think we've reached the end. Now we can't have a sequel if you guys have more things you want to talk about, but I'm, I'm getting noticed that there's an 18 month old that needs my attention. That Fair probably, enough. and typically what that means is he needs to be changed. <laughs> we should do an in-depth one on patterning and slug zeros. I think that's wonderful. Because it's fun to talk yeah. about it. Thank you for having us on, man. Really so appreciate it. Awesome, so dude. before we officially end, though, we're going to need to end with your guys' final thoughts, and then you need to plug whatever the hell you want to plug. Eric's probably going to plug Police One again. Uh, uh, oh, Adam. joke yourself. <laughs> chill, chill. <Joke> yourself. <laughs> Adam, what do you have for us? Your final thoughts, your plugs, where can people find you? Uh, yeah, my, my uh, final thoughts are kind of the same they always are, and that is uh, I will be the first to say I would much rather people go and spend their money on training instead of gear, uh, you know, especially I know that my stuff is pretty expensive, and I would rather you spend that on a class, learn what you're doing first. Um, you'll also learn what's going to work and what's not. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's my recommendation for, for people that are, you know, looking to spend money one way or another, get training. That's, that's the end of the day. Great investment. Um, and it's always with you. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. There you go. So where but, can people uh, find you? Uh, at the 
not intuitively spelled or pronounced eridus a r i d u s industries.com uh you know you can find whatever gear may be in stock at the that exact moment and you know uh if people are trying to track down stuff that's not in stock you know follow us on facebook and instagram we'll usually post updates whenever we have inventory and all that good stuff so cool matt thank you very much for having me it's always oh fun. yeah thanks for joining us uh eric uh, let's see eric Ellhouse, um cougar mountain solutions is my company on bookface and the instagrams um steve and i and a couple other folks the bulky hot givens will be doing yeah. the uh, shotgun summit uh September 9th, 10th, and 11th down in Dallas. I'm teaching shotgun and gun site on occasion. Yes. I will travel for classes. Uh, and while I have nothing to do with police one, <laughs> I am the editor of AmericanCop.com magazine. Um, and if you are an aspiring writer, hey, feel free to reach out if you've got decent stuff to do. Yep. Cool. Steve Yeti Fisher. Ooh. Um, my thoughts are this. Don't overlook this gun. Yeah. Get training on it. There's several great instructors in the shotgun from Gunsight to Thunder Ranch to Chris Fry to Rob Hot to many other people, right? Myself included. There's some amazing shotgun instructors out there. Don't be afraid to also go shoot a match with one. Some two gun, three gun, if that's your gig, definitely go play with it. If I were to tell people to buy one other accessory for that shotgun, especially if they're running a 1301, it would be to buy Adam stock adapter for the Magpul stock for that shotgun. It is probably one of the best pieces of gear that I've seen come out in years for a shotgun, especially the 1301 series of guns. And then the other one I would tell people to do just because of the current population and variety of ammo and availability, send the gun to Vang. You will always find a load of buckshot, no matter how great or inexpensive it is, that will give you very consistent patterns with their process on the gun. Cool. Anything else? No. Okay. No. Where can people find you? I don't know if I don't remember if you said that. There's okay, a lot of fine. people teaching guns. Sentinel oh, concepts. Fine. Com. I teach yeah, there we go. Shoot guns. <laughs> Yeah, uh, sentinelconcepts.com. I'm all over the country, uh, you know, 200 million days a year, basically, it seems, on the road doing this thing. And, yeah, that's where I'm at. Good deal. Cody. Yeah, uh, Vang Comp Systems, vangcomp.com, V-A-N-G-C-O-M-P.com. Yes. We've, we've been doing the damn thing for 32 years, um, just making shotguns shoot better, right? Changing the way the gun performs. So, like Fisher was saying, um, when ammunition is restricted, you don't want to shoot that good stuff. Vancom system makes the bad stuff shoot like the good stuff. So, uh, we actually change the way the, the shotgun shoots. Yes. What's that? And I wish Vancom would bring back the smiley face shotgun t shirt. <laughs> Man, that, for those you know of you kids that don't remember it, bring oh, that shot, yeah. bring the smiley face buckshot pattern shotgun back. One of these days, uh, yeah, uh, swag is going to happen. But, I mean, I, I want to say thank you to Matt for having me on here. Oh, uh, thanks for joining us. It's been my pleasure, man. Uh, I've been doing this here for 17 years, and we're, we're always learning, trying to make everything a little bit better, a little bit yeah. more efficient, a little more accessible. Yeah. Little known Vancom fact, they used to make some amazing custom 1911s and bolt guns. Hmm. Yeah, that's that's what GT. He's our head gunsmith in the back, and he's still that's that's his passion. He does it does it for fun. So, cool, but yeah. it, nowadays we're staying in the lane of shotguns, and you know, uh, instead of just turning your bird gun into a fighting gun, we're also uh, making production guns. So yes. that's that's coming down the pipe with force, uh, higher volume, lower price for uh, people to have a shotgun with horsepower on it out of the box. Cool, nice. I remember a couple years ago calling in to Van Comp and actually talking to Hans for. Mm -hmm. At least 30 minutes. Yeah, it was just cool. Wait a minute. Wait, you're amazing you're conversations. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Amazing yeah. conversations with Hans over 25 years with that man. Yeah. Like I was, I was so sad for Hans when I found out his dog passed. Like it was like oh, my own out. dog. Like that's the kind of friend. Yes. His, his ridge back. You know, that is the kind of relationship you had with Hans when you talked to him and you got in that circle. Like I felt for that dude when I found out his dog had passed. Like I was sad when I talked to him at Shot Show about it. Like I cried. Well, that's, that's what he instilled in us was to be honest, uh, honest, ethical, and moral. Yes. Don't lie, cheat, or steal. 
And yep. that's how that's I moved in with them when I was 15 in clean high school. Reverend. Great man. Yeah. Amazing what man. What are the other ones? There's clean reverent. Obedient, thriftful, whatever. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm glad someone knows what I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah. Uh awesome discussion. As per the norm, that was the shotgun episode. I've been waiting to do that. Um <laughs> As I say at the end, and sometimes at the beginning of every episode, make sure you are, you're finding those good sources, like the people that we all share with, and make sure you're subscribing to them. Make sure you are supporting them. Uh, there are some awesome channels out there. There's a lot of entertainment out there. There aren't that many awesome channels that are providing good info. Make sure you find them. Make sure you support them. Um, if you like what any of these guys say, make sure you're finding them. Make sure when you see their posts, I, I happen to really like um, Van Comp's posts, like on Facebook. They have some really cool <laughs> stuff. I like to share it because it's so cool. Thank you for that. Yeah, and, and that's one way you can you can support uh, various pages, people and whatnot. Same for primary and secondary. Uh, right now, I'm just going to tell you because I know you've been listening the entire time and we're going on almost three hours. Uh, thank you for already giving the thumbs up and for, for sharing because it's helpful for us because there's that whole algorithm thing that doesn't necessarily work in our favor. Uh, <laughs> those bigger, huge channels with, with all the following and tons of views, they, they basically corner the market for the algorithm. They are the algorithm. Your, 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 your votes of confidence with likes, shares, and all that kind of stuff helps us. So um, let's see here. I have a laundry list of things. So I have a somewhat affiliation with my Patriot Supply. Uh, they contacted me, and basically it's emergency food. Uh, basically, I'm kind of worried about where we're going as far as supplies of various things are concerned. Personally, for me, I have been buying, I've been buying Mountain House. I've been buying stuff as I see it, as I drop my shotgun, um, with, every pay, with every paycheck. Not a bad idea. Right now, what is it? Uh, fertilizer prices are through the roof. Uh, here locally, uh, a couple, of, one, one or two of the huge uh, chicken farms, they had to pretty much slaughter every chicken because there was some kind of a bird flu or something. So eggs are going to be non-existent in the area that I live for a short amount of time. So that means prices of everything are going up. I'm kind of worried about that. So if you go to prepare with P and S.com, there's a special deal for emergency food. If you happen to be in the market for that. Also scallywag tactical. Um, I've been using their knives for a few years now. I blame Steve Fisher. Matter of fact, I'm carrying one on me right now, the privateer. I really like that pocket knife. Um, if you go to scallywag, if you're buying something, if you use the code P and S 10, you can save a little bit of money. As a matter of fact, 10%. So there's that. Also, big thank you to our, our sponsors for the show. Big thank you to Big Tech's Ordnance, Filster, Primary Arms, Walther. Huge thank you to the Patreon subscribers. Without your support, we wouldn't be able to do this stuff. This week, we are doing two modcasts. Next week, we're going to do another two. Um, there are some big topics for us to discuss. The planets align to get the perfect panels for these. So I'm really excited about these uh, these discussions we have. Uh, tomorrow, we have the famed Tiffany. Uh-oh. Yeah, if you don't know Tiffany, you're, you're going to get to know Tiffany. We're going to be talking, and, and also, oh, I haven't seen her for a couple of years, but online I see her. Um, but we're going to be discussing the concept of when is it time to start teaching? A lot of people go through classes and kind of kind of tinker with the idea, we're going to discuss, okay, at what point is it time to start teaching versus just being a student constantly? Um, let's see here. What else? I think that's pretty much it. As I said before, though, make sure you are supporting those sources because it is beneficial to the community. It's, it's beneficial to all the, all the good guys. So let's see here. So we have 736 different Facebook groups. We have a forum. Make sure you're using that because that's a backup. Uh, a lot of us are seeing a lot of our posts on Instagram and Facebook getting removed. Uh, people are getting timeouts and getting removed from there as well. That forum is there for, for our use, uh, for your use. Primaryandsecondary.com slash forum. Also on Instagram, Twitter, all that other stuff. I uh, haven't got a special anything from Elon yet, though, because we're on Twitter. But, oh well. Yeah. All righty. Well, that's all. I'm going to go check on a kid and I'll probably go to bed and go to work in a couple hours. So talk to you guys later. <laughs>